When I was 10, I'm 36 now, my mother, 31, aunt, 28, almost three months pregnant, and sister, 5, and myself were Christmas shopping in a town about 45 minutes from my home. And my father, Southern Baptist preacher at the time, always made my mum call him on a payphone before we would leave the town that we were in to head home. So my mother did so right around 9pm when the mall that we were at was closing. After hitting up a drive through for drinks and snacks, we began our drive home. We would take a route home that consisted almost entirely of back roads. Roads with farmland on either side, occasional forests or farm homes. We are driving along a patch of road with farmland on our left that has a small patch of forestry behind it. As we close the distance between us and the mini forest, one of the adults says, It looks like those trees over there are on fire. I look and the wooded area is glowing a fiery orange. We're all looking in that direction of the trees, directly to our left now, when a brilliant white light, akin to semi-truck brights, floods our car and the source appears to be directly in front of us on the road. If you've ever passed out, you'll know what I mean when I say it's different from waking up. You're just sort of aware again or something. Anyway, it was like that for me. I opened my eyes to my mum and aunt wordlessly staring at each other. I looked around the car to see the windows are sort of lightly frosted over and my exhales are visible in the super cold car. My sister is just sitting there staring at the back of the seat in front of her. My aunt says to my mum, guess we can't get that loaf of bread you needed. To which my mum says nothing but instead starts up the car. We are in a small town now about 15 minutes away from home but not along our route home in a mum and pop grocery store parking lot called Harvest Market. Also, it is now 2.30 a.m. I'm aware that this should be impossible, but we finish our journey home to be greeted by the police cruisers in our driveway. My dad had called the police when we hadn't made it home at the expected time. A state officer drove our route home that we would have taken, worried that we were off the road somewhere. My father was furious, especially when my mother kept telling him that she didn't know where we were. She was crying and super scared. The officer at our house was really glad that we were home and they left. My family was at the time very religious so our five hours of lost time was just swept under the rug because there was no explanation that aligned with our perspectives. My aunt unfortunately lost the baby without any indications that a miscarriage had occurred and the OB doc told her that the fetus must have reabsorbed itself into her body. I had night terrors for years afterwards too, would wake up drenched in sweat, unable to recall what it was in my dreams that had me so scared. Thankfully, uh, I've since gotten over that. Now, I'm not claiming to have been abducted, but I can say with certainty that all four of us lost five hours, and my cousin just wasn't in my aunt's uterus anymore either. I've kicked around the idea of regression therapy, but I don't know if I trust it would work, and if it did work, I don't know if I want to know what happened, to be honest. I've shared this story in my 10th grade public speaking class. Please don't dox me if you know who I am. And my English teacher told me after class that she believed me, and it made me cry. I didn't think that I'd ever be able to talk about it outside of my family and best friends, but... She really empowered me to talk about it. The truth rings true and people recognize it when they hear it. It was my litmus test for my current partner of almost 12 years. I told him what happened a few months into us dating and he believed me. Not that I need to be believed, but it is validating. So, who the heck knows what happened, but the event dramatically changed my perspective and I've been on the hunt for the truth ever since. If anyone has any ideas as to how I could go about finding out what happened, I'm more than happy to hear your suggestions. I've attempted to undergo hypnosis before, not for this particular situation, just in general, and unfortunately it was unsuccessful. It very well could have been the hypnotist wasn't all that effective, or I just wasn't in the right mindset at the time, but I'm definitely open to trying again if anyone knows of someone who could help. Anyway... 
Happy hunting, fellow seekers, and stay safe out there. This took place a couple of years ago now. I was in middle school at the time. Myself, my sister, and my mum were both on our front porch, unlocking the door after coming home from school. But we noticed something was off right away because our alarms didn't go off, and my mum always made a point to set the alarm before we leave the house. Although that was weird, and we all noticed and commented about it, it was very possible that we just forgot to set it. And because of that possibility, we just ignored it and we moved on. As we entered the house and were beginning to set our backpacks and other stuff down, I heard a drawer close in my bedroom. I thought that I was just hearing things, so I looked at my mum and was about to ask her if she heard something. My mum looked at me at the same time, and her look of horror was enough for me to realise that she heard the same thing. My sister didn't seem to notice because she had her earphones in, but that sound and the fact that the alarm was off was enough for my mum to decide to get us out of there. She loudly said, I want to show you guys something in the backyard. Because she didn't want anyone in the house to know that we heard them and that's why we were leaving the house. My sister looked confused but I knew exactly what my mum just said and why she said it. As we entered the backyard and shut the door behind us, we sped walked towards the alley behind our house the only thing that separated us from it was a wooden fence. Once we reached that wooden fence, we opened the gate and began to exit into the alleyway. I was the last to exit through the gate, and before I shut the gate, I looked at the house one last time, and to my horror, I saw, standing there, someone looking at me through our curtains. We called the police, and unfortunately, they didn't find anyone, and... Also, weirdly enough, nothing was stolen. I never told anyone about what I saw, but I'll never forget that day. And it always sits really poorly with me that whoever was in there wasn't interested in our stuff. So I'm lucky enough to work in a Tudor Hall in the UK. The building is late 14th century, although much of it is late 16th century and later. It's timber framed and the electrics are in dire need of doing so. It has a sort of creaky and poorly lit old pile. Places like this tend to accumulate spooky stories and the hall is no exception with two old legends in particular. There have been loads of sightings around this place that have been reported by both staff and visitors. In the seven years that I've been there, I've been collecting those stories, and we've even made a ghost tour from them. I'm somewhat of a skeptic myself, but I have had three experiences that I just cannot really explain. I will now share two of them. So the first came in the summer of 2018. It was still bright out, so the hall wasn't too dark. I was closing the first floor of the house up on my own. I reached the room where a lot of the sightings centered around. Off to the side is a bedroom with a large oak door. I had my back to the main room whilst trying to close the door as the bolt was jammed. As I was doing this, a massive crash happened right behind me. I spun around in alarm expecting to see the suit of armor on the floor, but the room was deathly still. I could feel the vibrations through the doorknob, but needless to say, I was freaked out and I just left. The second experience was quite fleeting, but I'm sure of what I saw. Again, at the end of the day, about six months after the first experience, in the service wing, there's a sort of large Victorian kitchen, and just outside of its door is a small staircase leading up to the servants' quarters and a guest wing. I was heading into the kitchen to turn the lights off, but I looked up the stairs as I passed, and I saw someone in a long white dress pass across the top. It took me a moment as we had other staff in, but I realized that the last visitors had just left. Thinking that we must have missed someone, I went up the stairs and searched for this visitor. I looked through several rooms. In fact, I looked everywhere, but there was nobody there. Needless to say, it's a spooky old place and many of the staff don't like being there on their own. 
If I can figure out an easier way to share the other stories, I will. But for now, this will have to do. This happened in 2017. I was hanging out under a bridge with my friends when I was in high school. It was near my house and it had really cool graffiti, so we used to go there to take pics and just sort of hang out. Once, we decided to go at night and we were sitting on the far left of the ledge. Anyway, but we were just talking about random things and to the far right I saw the shadow figure of a man. Whoever it was, he was sitting on the edge of the ledge, just hanging out. I thought that I was tripping at first, so I kept looking, but every time I looked back, he was still there. And it was then that I realized that the shadow wasn't really a, a shadow from a person, but that the shadow was a person. I was convinced still that it was my mind playing tricks on me, but... Later on in the conversation, we started talking about the paranormal and my friend mentioned how this place was really creepy at night. I then mentioned how I thought that I kept seeing this figure over there. She was like, bro, I see it too. I was convinced that she was playing with me, so I didn't believe her at first. But she insisted that she saw it too and thought that she was tripping as well. I was like, you know what, I'm good, I'm out of here. I started walking by myself and praying. She was with her boyfriend and they had an electric scooter that they were going to ride on. So I was like, let me get a head start because there was no way that I was going to wait for them in that place alone. I eventually went home and after that, I never went back there again at night. These days, this story is a bit of a laugh for us. I'm no longer afraid of these types of things because I know now to protect myself against them religiously. Back then, I was much more afraid, but to this day, I swear that I know what I saw. There was a shadow man sitting there under that bridge. I, a 25-year-old female, have always been more in tune with the supernatural, and my first memorable experience, I just so happened to witness with my cousin. When we were much, much younger, my cousin, her name is Kay, and I went to a birthday party for one of our older cousins. Her name was Kat. It was a gorgeous day in June, and it was the perfect day to enjoy a nice summer breeze. My cousin Kat was having her party for her 12th birthday at the Duncan Park. While this park had its usual picnic tables and playground equipment, it was surrounded by weeping willows, which aren't that uncommon to find in this part of Mississippi. However, unlike other parks, this one was sitting right next to an old plantation house, an abandoned YMCA that closed down in the 70s, and the front of an old locomotive that the city was forced to fence off because my aunt had defaced it in her youth. My cousin Kay and I ran around the park while waiting for the rest of our family to show up and enjoy the festivities. That was when we saw them, two women, dressed up in pastel lacy dresses with bell skirts and bonnets. The style resembled that of the Civil War era. However, in our seven and eight year old brains, they were dressed like Barbie princesses. So we followed as we still had that child naivety when it came to stranger danger. They walked up the steps to the front porch of the Greek revival style home where we saw a few men in tailcoats adorned with top hats and what looked to be afternoon tea set up on a table. My cousin and I watched at a distance at first, completely entranced by the scene in front of us. It was honestly almost like something out of a fairy tale. We got a bit closer, and I remember we were going to ask them something. What were we going to ask, though? I don't remember. But I do remember that as soon as the word hey came out of our mouths... The ladies in dresses and the gentlemen in suits stopped what they were doing and then floated through the walls of the house, disappearing completely. My cousin and I stood there and looked at each other for a few minutes in disbelief at what we had just witnessed. Kay and I came to a silent understanding that no one would believe us since we were just children and would be written off as having overactive imaginations. We went back to Kat's party like everything was normal and didn't utter a word of what had just happened to, well, anyone. 
fast forward to when we were teens, we finally told my mum what we had experienced all those years ago. My mum told us that the Auburn plantation had reenactments in the spring, so what we must have seen was former residents enjoying the summer breeze like they were still amongst the living. But my cousin and I, we know what we saw that day, and it was not a reenactment. When I was in college, I was out and about with my then boyfriend. We had gone to dinner, then went to Walmart to get some typical college food so that we could survive a Sunday in. I was dressed up in a casual dressy fit, and we decided to split up while we shopped split apart, maybe to do quicker shopping, but I don't remember the exact reason why. I just remember that I was wandering the grocery aisles when I noticed this girl who was about my age. In a friendly manner, we casually smile at each other and continued on shopping. It didn't seem weird at first, but I kept noticing her in the same aisles as me, and a big muscular man was never far behind us. Eventually, I texted my boyfriend and asked where he was and continued on shopping. Next thing I know, the girl approaches me and says that she loves my jacket. I say, thanks, Maurice's, and try to move on. She stops me and says something along the lines of, hey, you look like you're my age and seem really nice. I just moved here for a new job and company my friends and I are starting up and tried to ask me questions about where I was from. I was vague and untrusting with what I said, noticing that this wasn't really that normal. Then she said, I'm looking for more people like you and I too work for our company. It's kind of a warehouse job and I would love for you to be on one of our bookkeepers. You should give me your number. I said, that's really nice of you to offer me a job, but I'm not a desk person and already have a job that I love. She said, that's a bummer. I thought we might work well together. Well, would you want to give me your number so that we can hang out? I would love to have a friend who can show me around the city. It was then that I realized that I wasn't getting out of this situation until my boyfriend showed up or I gave her my number. Eventually, I rattled off a fake phone number and said, hey, I'll catch you later. I gotta go. Then I walked away, praying my boyfriend would be near so that we could get out of there quickly. While I was looking for him and trying to call him, the girl called up to me and said, I tried to call you, but it said the number was out of service. And as I tried to come up with a quick excuse and say, maybe you typed it in wrong, she saw that my phone was unlocked and in my hand. She quickly snatched it and called herself on it. I was so flustered and mad at her that I snatched my phone back right when my boyfriend came around the corner. He instantly recognized that something was up and said that we had to go. When the girl saw him approach me, she looked really disappointed to see him and stopped trying to interact with me. We ended up buying nothing and leaving. That night, we called our parents and the police too. The police said that they didn't think there was anything in it or anything ill-intended, but I was sure that it was probably trafficking. I was going to switch my phone number because I was actually a little bit scared. I blocked them though and turned off all location access on my phone. I was too scared to go anywhere alone for a little while too. I even told my coach so that she knew. Anyway, a couple of days later I got a text from a random number. It was the girl. She sent a picture of my best friend who was out drinking downtown with some of her other friends. The text said, I met your best friend. She gave me your number because I told her that I was looking for a new friend. She showed me a picture of you and I said, what a coincidence. I met her the other day and lost her number when I got a new phone. About two minutes later, I got a text from my best friend that said, I gave your number to a girl who wants to make friends around here and is looking for people to join her business. And since I moved this week, I thought of you. I freaked out a bit at this and I told her that she needed to get away from this girl and not to leave alone with her. I stayed up worried until my best friend got home. She said that she was fine, otherwise I would have gone to pick her up. The next day, my best friend apologized and told me to block the number. My friend and her group tried to ditch her, but she kept showing up at the bars that they were at, which was weird because how did she know that they were there? 
She said the girl was relentless and texted her all night, trying to get my friend to hang out at her place. My best friend also said that when she asked about the business, the girl wouldn't give her many details, other than that it was a, a warehouse somewhere, would pay her great, in town, and if she wanted a tour of it, she would take her. Weirdly too, after this, we never actually heard from this girl again. It was as if she just fell off the radar completely. Anyway, today I was listening to a podcast and they mentioned different sex trafficking tactics. Two were actually vague jobs where they would pay you well but needed you to come meet them to give you more information. And also a new to town girl who desperately needs new friends. I've been thinking about this all morning and I'm really glad that I felt uncomfortable and that my friend didn't go with this girl as well but I'm mostly mad that the cops ignored my concern and said that it was nothing. I at least hoped that they wrote down the tip that night. I mean, I doubt they did, but honestly, it was really creepy vibes just all around, and the fact that she disappeared like that, I don't know, the whole thing was really fishy. This morning I woke up at my usual time, 5am, to go to the gym before classes. I'm off campus staying with my parents, however, they're away for the month so I've had the house to myself. And well, every morning I wake up, let my dog out to go and do his morning business, shower, brush my teeth and let him back inside before I get dressed and leave. This morning I woke up feeling a little bit weird. The house sort of had a bit of a strange energy to it, I guess, and my gut sensed that something was up. I let our dog out into our pitch black backyard. The deck light didn't turn on like it usually does, which was a bit unusual, but I didn't think too much of it and went to go and take a shower. After my shower, I went back to the sliding glass door to my dog to let him in, and I could see him sitting there waiting for me. I opened the door and watched him, a large black lab, walk in and go under a table. I then proceeded to close the door and walk to my room to get dressed. But here's where it gets weird. You see, as I'm leaving the area where the back door is, I felt that same strange feeling that I had been feeling all morning. I decided to look at the dog bed and noticed that he wasn't in it, so I looked back at the door and saw to my utter confusion that he was still sitting outside. My stomach instantly dropped. I mean, I could have sworn on my life that I watched him come in the house and go under a table. I walked back to the door, let my actual dog inside this time, and instantly searched my house to see if another animal came inside at some point, and I didn't find anything. As I thought more about it though, the thing that I let in before looked more like a, a shadow rather than a dog, I guess, and it sort of moved differently too, although it was around the same size. I called my girlfriend to tell her about it as she was waiting for me at the gym, and she said that it was probably just my imagination, but I have never, ever imagined something this real. I wasn't even tired too, and I definitely saw it. I noticed that my dog was acting a little strange too, staring at one of our walls and growling quietly as well. In any case, I left soon after and I got on with my day. I must admit though that I am a bit at a, a loss as to what to do. If anyone has a possible explanation to ease my nerves or knows what I should do next, then I would love to know because I'm really dreading sleeping there alone tonight. A couple of days ago, I was walking my dog around the lake at my condominium like I always do. It was around 6.30pm and the sky was getting a little bit dark. But my dog is a golden retriever and she's very friendly with people and other dogs too. She's six months old and she rarely barks or growls at anybody. She actually loves being petted by strangers in fact. But she's usually very calm too regardless of if people pet her or not. Anyway... 
We were walking and suddenly I turned around and I saw this guy coming out of nowhere. The guy looked a little bit odd. He had glasses and he sort of seemed to be walking nervously. He was still far away from us so I didn't think that he was nervous about my dog or anything. As he got closer to us though I just sort of stopped and moved to the side like I usually do when there is somebody coming from behind us. I do this so that they can walk ahead of us and my dog stops constantly looking back moving its tail looking forward to being pet but instead my dog just sort of starts getting I don't know like restless and also starts growling nervously while looking at this guy. I tried to calm her down and I smiled at the guy trying to be friendly but the guy just sort of looked at me with a really serious face and started reaching for something out of his backpack. At this point, my dog just starts barking and I get this bad feeling and a shiver goes down my spine. For a second, I thought, what if the guy had a weapon or something? The guy just kept walking, looking at me while reaching for something in his backpack. As my dog kept barking at him, I apologized for my dog's behavior and tried to tell him that my dog usually doesn't behave like that. But the guy just seemed to ignore me altogether. Finally, he just passes us and my dog starts barking again, but she's still really agitated. I just sat down next to her trying to calm her down while the guy just got lost between some of the houses at one point, instead of just walking the lake path, which seemed very weird to me. Now, maybe I was just being paranoid. Maybe the guy just didn't like dogs, which is fine, I guess. I try to be really respectful to people who don't like dogs. But after he got lost from our sight, my dog just went back to her usual friendly self and we were able to finish our walk. But I don't know, something felt really off about this guy and the encounter altogether made me feel really uncomfortable. To preface this, I've dealt with sleep paralysis, night terrors, and shadow people since I was a child. I think it all started when maybe I was around 9 or 10, and it got worse as I entered my teenage years. Granted, I was dealing with a lot of abuse and childhood trauma at the time, so when they stopped after I moved out at 19, I just chalked it all up to stress. Flash forward to the present though, I've moved into this new apartment a couple of states over from my hometown almost four months ago now. But things have felt really good here too. I live with my roommate or best friend, 28 year old female, and her two cats and her dog. But I felt the vibes were kind of off sometime last week and I smudged the house and kept all the windows open to help air out the negative energy and bring in some more positive energy. Later that night, my roommate confessed to me that she'd been seeing shadow people in the hallway at night, and that the night before, one came up and actually touched her door handle. We keep her door propped open for the cats to run in and out, otherwise they scream. I assured her though that I felt something was off too, and I already cleansed the house. We had no problems the rest of the week, and she still hasn't seen any shadow people since then. However... Friday night, I went to bed as normal, had no problems falling asleep. My room stays pretty illuminated with a bright blue light that comes from the speakers on my PC, but the light never shuts off on the speakers, even when my PC is off. So, I can see everything really well in my room at night. And at some point, I woke up from a dream and I saw what I can only describe as a demonic woman... She sort of looked like the girl from the ring, but in what looked like, I don't know, aeroplane stewardess clothes? The best way that I can think to describe it. She was in my open closet though, on my clothes like a rock climber, and she sort of tilted her head so far back that her face was upside down and facing me. She had a long tongue and she was moving her head all around and shaking it like crazy. I couldn't move. I tried to reach for my phone to call my roommate to wake her up or bang on the wall behind me, the opposite side of her room. So I was just stuck there laying there and watching this weird demon lady on my clothes in my closet. I was able to rationalize and tell myself that it's all a dream over and over again to try and wake myself up out of it. 
I finally woke up as I was trying to yell for help, but it kept coming out as a, a sort of whisper. I finally jumped out of bed in my empty room, and after looking around, she was gone. I was able to fall almost right back asleep after shaking off the whole experience, but I went ahead and cleansed my room again Saturday morning and spent some extra time on that closet as well. I mean, I've had sleep paralysis before, but this, this felt a bit different. I slept fine Saturday night, and last night the room felt good. Now, I haven't had any stress or have had anything happen that would trigger these again. It would suck if I moved several states away from home and straight into a haunted apartment. But if you have any thoughts and ideas on what I can do, that would be much appreciated. My girlfriend told me, like two weeks ago, that she was waiting in line at the convenience store with her friend in Chinatown, New York City, and this large, dapper-looking man came over to them. Apparently, he complimented her coat and commented how expensive it must be. She said thank you, and they chatted for a little longer. The man explained how his suit was just a, a Brooks Brothers suit, but she noticed that he had all sorts of expensive jewelry on. When my girlfriend and her friend explained that they were students, he kept making assumptions about how they must be rich and that their parents are paying for everything. My girlfriend was starting to feel uncomfortable and began trying to distance herself from him. He asked them if they had jobs and they told him no, as they were students. After this, he went on to tell them what he does for a living, without being asked, mind you, and he said, I do all sorts of odd jobs, this and that. I mainly have these guys that work for me though. I find them off the streets and feed them and give them a place to stay. I'm waiting to meet up with them now. He referred to them as his minions, which made something that at first seemed wholesome, very unsettling all of a sudden. He then told them that he had just had his wallet stolen and he did $400 for something. I don't remember the reason. He told them that he could pay them back later that week, but he needed the money right now. My girlfriend politely declined and at this point was really uncomfortable. She started walking towards the door to leave and said, Nice to meet you and good luck. And they both walked outside and sat on a bench outside of the convenience store. As they were sitting and discussing the strange interaction, they saw the man exit and stand outside about 10 feet away, waiting for a few minutes, looking at his phone. He then met up with two other men and they chatted for a few minutes. The large man in the suit then walked the other direction, and the two other men then walked into the store and started holding it up with knives. Absolutely shocked and frozen, they both watched as the cashier put her hands up, then emptied out the cash register. The two men ran out of the store in the same direction as the man in the suit walked. We were both about to call the police, but saw that the cashier already was. They waited at the bench until the two police cars showed up and then they walked in to tell the officers what they had just witnessed and tried to help identify the robbers and the man that they had just met. I wonder though if this is a common thing in terms of organized crime because to me it looked like this guy had paid homeless people to rob and commit this crime. This happened to me quite recently. For practical and economic reasons, I used the taxi service, the fixed price, which cost me less than taking my vehicle, especially given the place where I live, as it's an ultra-rural village isolated from all cities, and where necessarily to go to the bank or go shopping, you have to hit like 10 to 20 kilometers. In general, the taxi service I use is ultra-professional, recent vehicles, clean, maintained, friendly driver, always a, a friendly random conversation, always on time, and almost always the same drivers too. But one day, three or four weeks ago, I was entitled to a new driver, which was nothing special I suppose. It seemed like the same impeccable service, nothing to complain about really. But two weeks ago, this gentleman, who already told me to call him by his first name, gave me his age, his nationality, information that came out of nowhere, 
and continued his conversations by explaining that he bought a, a connected printer but can't get it to be recognized by his smartphone. So I try to give him some advice and it sort of stops there. Again though, this driver has a, a really enthusiastic mood. A little bit too much for my taste, so I don't pay attention to it. He keeps talking to me about his printer again and blurts out to me, You who work in this field, you can help me. I, I can't. It's not connected. If you want, we can add ourselves on Messenger and you can help me. Since we had arrived at my destination, I stammered out an answer, something like, I'll think about it later. But I knew that I needed to not talk to this guy about my work because I'm actually a computer technician, among some other things, so it would be obvious that he could get my number for this. In the end, though, I ended up forgetting about this moment since I had to help a friend. I was mired in a complicated divorce situation where there was domestic violence and stuff. Suffice it to say that this divorce worried me a lot and that this moment with the taxi, I just ended up forgetting about it because of all this. Except that I had to move and I necessarily called the taxi again. And after barely getting in, a sudden urge to get out of the vehicle came over me all of a sudden. He says hello to me, but using my first name, asks me for news about my father's health and some more playful humor, I guess. I specify that once again I never mention my first name, nor mention my father to this driver. Suffice it to say, though, that after this, we sort of drove in silence. In any case, I, I do what I have to do, and in the store parking lot, I call the taxi center to order a taxi for the return. The gentleman replies that there is already a vehicle that has dropped off an old lady, that I have to meet her and notify her instantly that she can pick me up. I arrived at the level of the driver, and again, it was this same driver, with a big smile, he helps me by putting my bags in the trunk. And at this point, he sort of gives me a tactile gesture on my back. A kind of, I don't know, it felt like a bit of caressing almost. Whatever it was though, it made my blood run cold. The driver though asks me to get in the front because the rear doors have a problem unlocking or something. And it was at this point that I honestly almost backed out of this. I get in the front though, telling myself, 10 kilometers by car, it will go quickly, and I tried to hide my emotions. But that was a mistake. This ultra-curious guy was talking to me, asking me a ton of questions, and it almost seemed like he was trying to, I don't know, direct my answers. The questions were very focused on explicit content though, increasingly scandalous, not to say that things got very direct after a while too. He would insist upon things like, when I finish, you must compliment me. Have you ever tried the Moroccan cigar? And always with a really awkward smile, touching the limits of my crotch, tactile movements in my direction while I was limiting sticking to the door. He was trying to hold my wrist though as I was attempting to fix my hand over the central locking button. The doors which had no problems in the end, since the onboard computer didn't indicate any warnings. They were accessible, and I genuinely thought about just jumping out at one point. And of course, instead of taking the shortest route, he took the longest, which reduces the time of the route from 10 to 15 minutes to almost 50 minutes. It was also in an ultra-isolated wooded area, which obviously didn't help. In the end, I just tried to maintain my composure, I responded vaguely to his comments or tried to make little jokes, hiding my growing anxiety. I don't know and I don't really want to know what this guy was up to, but I arrived at my place, I took all of my bags in one foul swoop and I just got the heck out of there. At home in the hour that followed, the driver spoke to me on WhatsApp too. I blocked him directly after that and I didn't read any more. But after calming down, I contacted the taxi company or I explained the situation and the guy on the phone just answered me with are you talking about so and so I answered in the affirmative and then he answered me in a, a really weird way almost in a very I don't know like mafia intonation 
I have no other images in mind to describe it, but it was like, don't worry, we'll take care of it. So on the one hand, I said to myself, I may not have been the first person that this guy tried it on, which is scary, and also that this will take care of it. I don't know. After this, I think I'm going to use another taxi service. This whole situation is still spinning in my head, and to be honest, I'm still processing it all, and I don't know what to think. This was in 2011, a year after I'd, a female, 22 at the time, had graduated college. I was living in my first apartment with a friend. I had adopted the sweetest dog that I'd ever had, a runt of the litter, Pomeranian, who literally loved every person that she ever met. My nephew, who was young at the time, would sometimes handle her a little bit roughly. Sweet kid and we'd correct him, but he didn't quite realize how little she was under all that fur and she tolerated it without ever nipping or anything. One day though, my roommate was gone and there was a knock at the door. There was a handyman who said that he was there for an annual check on appliances. He was wearing the apartment complex's standard uniform and had a badge, so I didn't really think twice about it. Even though I hadn't been notified that this would be happening, I just went ahead with it anyway. He comes in and begins chatting and sort of, I don't know, like leering, I felt a bit uncomfortable, but not really as freaked out as when my dog came rushing in between us. He is back, teeth bared, and started growling at him. He kind of awkwardly laughed and went to pet her. Weird choice for a dog that is baring its teeth at you. And she immediately lunged forward like she was going to bite this guy. He leaped back before she could bite him. Tiny dog, large man, but he was obviously freaked out by her. At this point, she is straight up barking at this guy. He asked if I could put her away while he worked, and I lied and said that she had separation anxiety, so I recommended that he come back another time when I could walk her, or when my roommate was there so one of us could be in the room with her. And so he left, but strangely, he never did come back. My dog lived another seven years and not once did she ever growl at any other human, let alone try to bite one. You hear about dogs being able to read people, so while I didn't know if he would have done anything to me while on company hours, I still think that she could sense that he wasn't a good person. In any case, I'm glad that she was there that day and it is strange that he never did come back. This was about 12 years ago on a September day. It was time for me to renew my license, so me, my wife and two sons, who were one and two years old, set out to drive a few towns over, about 45 minutes away, and renew my license. It was a crispy fall day. I still remember how beautiful it was. We left home at about 8am or so because we knew that we would be back home by 11 and have some time with the babies before our daughter got off the bus at 2.40pm. We had plenty of time. We arrived at the DMV a few minutes after 9. My wife stayed with the kids while I ran into the DMV. I got my license and walked about 10 minutes till 10. As I walked to the car, I saw my wife standing outside smoking and our babies were asleep. We got in the car to come home and that's where things got very strange. You see, as we pull out of the plaza and onto the off-ramp, I began to feel very weird. I felt a, I don't know, like a vibration inside of me. I'm not talking about a vibration like driving on the rumble strip or sitting on a washer or something. I'm talking about it felt like the cells inside of my body were vibrating at a, a sort of subatomic level. I've never felt that before, but I began to wonder if I was having a medical emergency or something. As I looked over at my wife as we drove down the off-ramp, we both sort of faded into the black. Next thing I know, I'm watching those white painted divider strips in the middle of the highway that separate the lanes, each one passing by very quickly, and I'm watching, thinking how interesting this is, just one after another. I'm in some kind of a trance or daze or something. It felt very strange. I wasn't in control of myself, though, but 
Then I looked over at my wife and she was leaned all the way forward in her seat, close to the windshield, seatbelt extended all the way, her eyes were wide open, and her mouth was gaped open too. I've never seen her do that before, nor since then, and at the same time I thought that it was very strange. Then I go back to watching those white lines on the highway, then it's as if I start fading back in. I sort of become aware of my hands on the steering wheel once again. I look back over at my wife and she closes her mouth and leans back in her seat. It seems that we must have come to at the same time. Then it was as if I was released and given full control and I was now fully aware and I said, what the heck is going on? Where are we? My wife is looking around puzzled. She checks the babies and they're still asleep. I'm trying to figure out where we are, but there's just no way because we're now getting ready to drop into the capital city. This isn't even the way that we were traveling. I immediately pull off the highway and we start discussing what just happened. I asked my wife what the last thing she remembered was, and she said coming off the ramp right after we left the DMV. I said me too, and I told her about the vibrations that I felt and how I just sort of faded to black. We were stumped, a little panicked, obviously. But I then see the clock, and it's 2 p.m. There's just no way. I asked where four hours went, and we're so far out of our way that just none of this made any sense. My wife had to call my parents and have them pick up our daughter off the bus. My mum asked if everything was okay, and my wife said that we're all okay, but no, and that we would explain when we got there. At this point, it was closer for us to drive through the capital city and come around the back way home. We were about an hour and 45 minutes from home, and as we drove home, I kept trying to rationalize everything. I would say a few words and then stop. She was doing the same thing. We finally got home, I told my mum and dad what had happened, and they know that we aren't liars or anything, and they didn't really know what to say. But this happened, and to this day, I don't know what it was. I don't want to dox myself or anything, but this also happened where a very famous UFO or alien monster thing happened many years ago. In any case, though, about two months later, we were in bed asleep and I woke up all of a sudden. There was a dull blue light in our bedroom in the front of the windows. It was about the size of a basketball and I laid there looking at it. I could see that it was three-dimensional too. I dug my elbow into my wife's side and said, look. We watched for a couple of minutes, then it just seemed to turn off. I got up and tried to debunk what it was, but there's nothing that could have created that effect. Is it connected? I don't know, but not long after this I noticed a scar on my right wrist. It's a perfect triangle shaped scar about the size of a pea I would guess. Have no idea where that could have come from. My wife checked herself but didn't find anything out of the ordinary on her. Okay, so we live in a very touristy sort of lake town. We were out and about and I saw a tourist magazine on the counter of a local gas station. Later when I'm home, I'm sitting in my chair just thumbing through it. And that's when I come across an account that someone had sent into this tourist magazine. And my jaw hit the floor. This lady said that her and her husband had come to our lake on vacation and had a really strange occurrence. She said that they were in a small canoe going across the lake when all of a sudden they just blacked out or something and then woke up sitting in the canoe in a dry drainage ditch beside the lake. If I remember right, she said that they were 15 to 20 feet from the lake water. They didn't understand how they ended up there and they were really scared. They had to carry their canoe back to the water and paddle away. That's how far away they were. And she said that they packed up camp, left quickly, and that they were never going to come back here. This happened when I was about 12. I still remember it vividly as I've told the story many times since, so I figured that I'd share it here with all of you. I was staying with my grandparents and aunt in Bryan, Texas, She's always been more like a cousin to me because she's one year younger than me. 
My dad was with us the first night, but he had to head off to do some work or something and left me with the grandparents for the remainder of the stay. I was staying in the room where my grandparents were caring for my since-departed great-grandmother, since it was the only free room in the house. The couple nights leading up to the incident, there was really nothing out of the ordinary too. Then on the third night, I went to bed like usual and everything was fine. I always left the door sort of cracked open a bit, so it was also cracked on this specific night. The first thing that I remember that startled me was the old rotary phone making a noise out of nowhere. These phones were before my time, so I don't know exactly how they work, but it made this really long continuous sort of beeping noise for what felt like about two or three minutes before it stopped. Kind of freaked out. I didn't really think much of it, to be honest. I mean, maybe it was malfunctioning. It eventually stopped on its own, too, which made me feel better. But the thing that really scared me was shortly after the beep stopped, I then noticed a shadow outside of the cracked door, which appeared to be someone walking by, which didn't startle me at first, but... As it went by, the door slammed really hard. My scared 12-year-old self instantly pulled the blankets over my head and I was scared, but eventually I must have fallen asleep because all I remember is waking up the next morning. The next morning after I woke up, I saw my aunt and she also seemed terrified. I asked her what was wrong and she asked me if I was walking around last night. I said no and... She seemed really scared, so I asked why she asked me. She said that she was awake in her bed late at night and heard something making noise. She then said that she stared at her door and it opened. And a tall black figure made its way into her room. Her bed was positioned in such a way that there was a small gap between the bed and the wall. And she told me that she saw the figure got scared and basically rolled herself and her blanket over into the gap between her bed and the wall and stayed there all night out of fear. Obviously, this freaked me out a bit too, but now we both thought that maybe it was her dad walking around at night. I also often forget to mention too, but the house also had a home security system that made a very loud beep every time a door or window was opened so neither of us thought that it would be a home invasion or anything like that. But then, not even five minutes later, both her parents wake up and come out of their room and asked us if we were walking around last night because they heard lots of noise. Neither me nor my aunt have really said anything about it to each other since then, but I do think that we both came to the same realization that there was something odd going on in the house that night. So I've had many things happen to me in my life. I've seen a full body shadow apparition which turned out to be the so called hat man which I discovered by accident in uh, another place. I've seen objects move, sometimes two objects at the same time that are about 10 feet apart. I've had my locked door open and close on its own which requires another whole story to explain because there's a lot of details to it. I've captured over a dozen Class A EVPs, some of which are the clearest you'll ever hear. I've recorded an EVP of a person who told me his full name to find out that he wasn't even dead yet, but died two days later after the EVP. I've recorded spirit box sessions, and I understand the doubt in all this, but it works. I have two sessions that there's just no denying that it answered directly. I've had things thrown at me, been laughed at sarcastically by a voice. I'll post separate stories about all these experiences at some point and go into great detail. But what I'm getting at is that none of these things actually scared me. I even would say out loud the names of whatever these things were and that they don't scare me. There's only one incident though that actually did scare me. You see, at one point... Out of the blue, I woke up out of a trance in front of my stove with the burner on and a knife with a plastic handle in the frying pan with the handle melting. I had no idea what happened. My girlfriend told me that I called her and apparently wasn't making any sense. 
I had pieces of food in the freezer with knife slashes all over them. And the craziest thing of all is that I had a room air cleaner balancing perfectly upside down in the bedroom, which is impossible to do. In fact, I tried it well over a dozen times, trying to stand it upside down, but it doesn't have the top surface where it's possible, so I still have no idea how that happened. But what I'm getting at here is that I had no control over myself for, I would guess, maybe half an hour. And something happened. I started thinking about how some murderers said that they blacked out when savagely stabbing someone, or how someone who everyone thought was completely normal just lost it, and they commit mass murders for just no reason. And now I have to wonder if maybe there's some truth to it. And maybe true evil does exist. Because I have a feeling that maybe I was possessed. And what if my mother or somebody else that I love was in that house with me that day? What would I have done? Would I have just been limited to the few spaces and the few weird things that I had done? Or would something much worse have happened? One night after a student party, my mate and I decided to bike up a mountain to where the city had installed hammocks so we could watch the sunrise. It was at times a steep incline and we only had our bike lights to guide us. My friend was in better shape than I, got well ahead of me. Halfway towards our destination, we then heard a rustling come from the hill to the right and before I knew what was happening, my friend had turned his bike around and started pedaling fast. Right at that moment, a rugged guy with long hair and a beard ran down the hill and tried to lunge for my bike. He near managed to grab the handlebars, but I turned around just in time to follow my mate and started pedaling as quickly as I could. Let me tell you though, flying down a mountain in the pitch dark with a terrible bike light, with someone running after you screaming, is legitimately terrifying. He ran all the way to the entrance of the forest and he stood there watching a cycle away. It was really creepy and the whole thing just felt really off. Almost like it was planned. So a few years ago, I lived in an apartment complex in San Antonio, Texas. I... 26-year-old female, lived there for about four years with a couple of my best friends. Over the years, I would run in a neighborhood that was close to our apartment complex. I've actually had a couple of weird things happen to me throughout the years running through there, as well as at our complex, but this event was definitely the most terrifying moment in my life and caused me to stop running in that neighborhood altogether until life finally found my friends and I moving to a different city. So over the years of running in that neighborhood, I became familiar with this one house that gave serious trap house vibes. It was very out of place for the neighborhood, as there was an elementary school just up the street, and the area is not a high crime area by any means. It was a corner house that was at the first stop sign of my running path, so closest to my apartment, and housed a, a group of about six huge men. That's usually about how many I would see together at a time anyway and they always had people coming and going. Sounded like they threw a never-ending party, and their property smelled strongly of weed. As a woman and avid watcher of crime documentaries, I'm constantly paranoid and observant of my surroundings, which is why I'd come to know that house so well. Throughout the years, I'd always managed to see them, but they never saw me. But the last year we lived there, that all changed. So just so you guys know, it wasn't dark at all during this event. The sun was out and shining brightly, and it was about 5.30pm or so. I'm at the start of my path, and I'm coming up to that first stop sign in the house. Per usual, I look for them in their vehicle and any potential traffic, and I see that they aren't home. They only had one vehicle that they would all pile into, and it was a big black Tahoe or something. I'm not a car expert by any means, but that's just my guess. I continue on my run though, which takes me further up past that house and into another neighborhood where I would run around in a cul-de-sac a few times before running back down that path. 
I'd say maybe about an hour and a half passes by, and then I decided to head home after the sun starts to set and it gets dark. As I'm running home and coming up to that house and the stop sign, I'm listening to music and running and see that I'll need to stop at the stop sign because of traffic. I'm coming up to the stop sign which puts the house to the right of me and the stop sign to the four-way intersection to the left of me. And I credit what happened next to trusting my instincts, remaining observant and being in band and softball. I was honestly really tired from my run so I was kind of looking down at the ground rather than ahead but I always utilize my peripheral vision. Shout out to being a band nerd. If you know, then you know. So I take off to run across the street to the sidewalk that will take me to the fence on the side of my apartment complex. It didn't have a door, so I would just either hop it or slide under to run down that path. And I see that the vehicle that had been stopped at the stop sign perpendicular to me is the vehicle that I know to belong to the house that was just on the right of me. Out of the corner of my eye, I see them turn like as if they're going to go down this street when I think, huh, that turn seemed too wide like a U-turn which is weird since their house is right there. I take all of two tired steps. I was out of energy at this point. Before I just get this sinking gut feeling. Now, I have never in my life felt this feeling before. But immediately I felt danger at my back and everything in my body and mind told me to run for my life. So I did. With that feeling of fear in my stomach and danger at my back, I sprinted down the sidewalk with renewed vigor and slid under the fence like I was sliding to home plate. I immediately popped out and turned around to look outside the fence where I had just been and that was when I saw them. The group of men that... I'd only ever seen in passing, were sitting in their car on the street outside of my apartment complex fence with their windows down and all six of them were just staring at me with predatory eyes. We stared at each other for what seemed like a long time before I watched them drive away and once they were out of sight I ran to my apartment and locked myself in there scared to show them exactly where my apartment was as I was worried that they were circling the complex looking for me. I told my friends what happened and spent the rest of the night full of adrenaline, pacing and reflecting on what had just happened, whether or not these guys knew where I lived. Those men purposely chose not to go home, but pulled a U-turn to follow behind me as I was running away. Recounting the story over the years, I've had people tell me that it was just so that they could view my butt as I ran or something. But when I remember that feeling in my body that was almost a voice in my head yelling at me to run like my life depended on it. And I think of their blank faces and dark eyes staring at me from inside that vehicle. I seriously question what their true intentions were that day. Several years ago, I walked a handful of blocks up the street from my partner's house to a convenience store to buy something to drink. It was about 11pm and I was trying to slide in there before the store closed. To set the scene too, we lived in a, a transitory neighborhood that was chock full of abandoned houses and crime, with a few occupied residences and businesses scattered about. There were zero street lights or illumination of any sort, Envision a, a more compact version of the type of Detroit neighborhood exemplified in the movie Barbarian, and you won't be far off the mark. Looking back, the nighttime excursions to the store from my place to his were absolutely idiotic on my part. But after living in that environment for years, I guess you just become accustomed to it. Anyway, it was one of my many foolhardy nighttime store trips. My partner by then would ask me not to do it, but I just ignored that. I mean, I wanted my drink after all. Really dumb of me, I know. I got the few blocks up the street in the usual darkness, got my drink, and left the store to head back. Outside the store, a guy was standing near the trash can, hassling everyone who came out, asking for money, cigarettes, etc. I told him that I didn't have anything, and started to cross the parking lot and head back, 
but this guy sprang after me like a freaking rabbit and grabbed a hold of my arm. He starts aggressively demanding that I go to a party with him and trying to steer me down this pitch black side street just beside the convenience store. He was probably 6'7", crazy tall and super thin, with dreads all in his face, making it hard to even see what he looked like. His fingers, though, bit into my arm and felt like they pinched a nerve. My heart starts pounding like crazy right away. I was used to brushing off this type of behavior, having lived in that neighborhood for several years by then. But this... This was way more aggressive than anything that I had faced so far. I shook my arm out of his grasp, told him that I was heading to my boyfriend's place, and it was only a few blocks down the street. He was waiting for me. I said sorry in an attempt to placate him, and I took off speed walking down the street at top speed. He called after me several times, and then I heard his quick footsteps as he apparently decided to follow me down the street. By then, I could feel my heartbeat in my eyeballs. My mouth had gotten cotton dry and I was almost hyperventilating with fear, trying to stay quiet so this guy wouldn't hear me. I had this feeling that to show fear or to look back at him would cause him to react violently right away, so I just put on a burst of speed and tried to outwalk him. However, my five five legs were no match for his crazy long stride and I could hear little pieces of rock and concrete crunching under his feet as he closed in on me. I literally felt like my heart would leap out of my chest or explode from fear. I tried to walk even faster, but I could hear the guy right behind me now. I could hear his breath in my ear and got this overwhelming feeling that he was going to grab me at any second, maybe even with a weapon, and try to force me to walk wherever he wanted me to go. The neighborhood is pitch black and there's no real through traffic, not at night. If he wanted to force me to go with him, I would be powerless, save for trying to run from him. But with his height advantage, I knew that he'd catch me quickly. Then, I could finally see my boyfriend's driveway and him standing at the end of it waiting for me. He had a terrible feeling that night and already worried constantly about me walking at night so he'd come outside to wait for me. I saw that he had his crowbar in one hand, his usual defense weapon, kept near the front door, and then my nerve broke, and I started sprinting toward him, and the tall dude behind me started to run after me. I reached the place where my boyfriend stood and squeaked out help, or something like that, dove behind him and cowered, waiting for the tall dude to pull a gun out and shoot us both or start struggling with my boyfriend. But it didn't happen. Instead, he gets right up in my boyfriend's face, standing way too close to him, and then just asks for a light. My boyfriend gives him one, holding the crowbar aloft in the other hand so that it was very visible. Then I grab a hold of him and yank him into the house, locking the door and absolutely losing it, sobbing and freaking out while trying to choke out what happened. My boyfriend goes looking from the windows and sees him kind of standing around and eventually then leaving. He saw him here and there for months afterward too, up at the store or walking up and down the street right outside of our place. Unsurprisingly, I'm sure, I never took another nighttime walk. And to this day, I still sometimes have nightmares about it. This all started back in 2014 at a youth hostel in Utah. I woke up screaming in a dorm room after opening my eyes to a mouthless, black-eyed young girl sitting on my chest and staring me in the face, inches away from me. From there, and as my alcoholism got worse and spiritual energy levels became corroded and more dark, that's the best way that I can put it, it started happening a lot more. It came in different forms, faceless demons, old ladies, grim reaper, etc, etc, but always the same thing, terrifying and even painful. By painful I mean I would be choked, my left side of my throat seems to feel the most pain, also I would get electrocuted or what feels like electrocution anyway. Strangely too, many times I can sense when it will happen, 
I can almost feel this overwhelmed feeling of dread and fear, like some sinister evil envelops me and fills the room, just waiting for me to drift off ever so slightly so that it can attack and begin to choke me. I hear terrible things whispered into my ear, how horrible I am as a person, mocking me relentlessly to the point where I would break down in tears. One instance of that was in the form of two witches who would talk smack about me, like soul-crushing stuff that... I don't know why I was so affected by, but each time I would slip into a hypnagogic state, I would tap into their conversation about me. Between that and the choking or sort of electrocution thing, it makes you not want to sleep at all. The scariest part of all this is one sleep paralysis incident when I woke up screaming after the usual strangulation and hateful rhetoric from the death wraith grim reaper looking thing and... I woke up near tears from fear and sadness, and shock even. I told my wife about it finally for the first time. Usually I would just keep it in because even after these intense episodes, you know people just don't get it, so I kept it to myself. But anyways, my wife told me that I actually had a handprint or choke marks on my throat, and when I went to the mirror, sure enough, I did. It actually looked like a humanoid red handprint, and it wasn't subtle. It was like someone had grabbed my throat and strangled me, and you could see it. Recently, I've been having this happen more and more too, but without the humanoid entities. Just the presence and the sensation, I guess. Last night, I had these tentacle jellyfish looking things that seemed to be extracting energy or something from me, and it was painful. In my worst encounters, it feels like my soul is literally being ripped from my body, but since I've gotten sober and life is a whole lot more mellow and generally positive, it's gotten less intense, but I still feel it, and honestly, it's really messing up my quality of life. I miss dreaming good dreams. I can't remember the last good dream that I've had, and if I do have one, it's always infiltrated or hijacked by this messed up entity. Whether it be real or psychological, it doesn't matter. It's affecting me. It happens during periods of light awakeness too, where I can still see my room and surroundings, and light hypnagogic states, but also in dreams too, where the entity seems to hack into the dream characters like Agent Smith in The Matrix, and they suddenly take this malevolent, hateful energy, and the rest of my dream, they're just trying to murder me. I hate suffering from this stuff, it's terrifying, and it just won't stop being terrifying. But it's grown to the point where I'm just annoyed by it now. If I am being haunted by something, it's definitely earned my mutual contempt, and I want to learn how to fight back and even kill this thing. So if you can help me with this, I would be really grateful. My mum passed away when I was super young, before I even really knew her, so I spent a while with my dad when I was really young. In fact, my earliest memories were living at my grandma's place. The house was a big house near the beach. My grandma and grandpa built the house, so no one had lived there before us. Anyways, I love that house, but a specific area of the house always made everyone feel, like, uncomfortable. This area was in the basement near a cellar. My memory back then is kind of foggy because it was so long ago, but I remember spending a lot of time with my grandma since my dad was working and whatnot. Now, we used to pray every night, go to church every Sunday, and I was fairly Catholic at the time. And I remember eventually seeing these shadow people. They looked almost like skeletal shadows that would peek out from behind doorways and corners, signaling me to follow them. They also had glowing eyes and a, a sharp, almost jagged, black, shadowy, skeletal body. Now, I remember ignoring them for a long time, but one day, growing curious, I followed one. I saw one near my grandma's room doorway and walked to the doorway, turning the corner, and when I did, it was gone. Then it reappeared at the stairway to the basement down the hall and signaled me to follow again. I followed it again and it was gone this time appearing at the bottom of the stairs in the basement. As a kid, I was terrified of that basement, so at that point I stopped following. 
Some more time passed and eventually curiosity took the better of me and I ended up following it into the basement the next time that they showed up. When I turned the corner in the basement, I remember seeing this person. They were towering above me. I'm like five or six years old tops though, so everyone towered over me, but you get the point. And they had a, like, a deer skull with horns instead of antlers for a head, wore a big fur cloak, and behind them was just darkness. I remember them slowly pointing at me, then I screamed and I ran for it right back up the stairs. Over the next couple of weeks, I'd see this thing in different places. One time hanging itself off the door, other times standing in the trees near the river. I learned later my family was getting messed with in a way of weird dreams and odd events like poltergeist stuff as well. But eventually I stopped seeing this thing in person and it plagued my dreams instead. I couldn't get a night's sleep without this thing appearing, turning it into a nightmare until sometime I remember someone coming to me in the dream. They told me to fight and banish this being and so I did. I remember in the dream grabbing a broom handle or a stick and hitting this thing when it showed up. The dream seemed to sort of crack and it was at that point that I woke up. I realize dreams are weird things so I really don't know what to make of that. It could be nothing. But years went by and I forgot about the whole thing until I was about 13 or 14-ish. I was hanging out with some friends and as we were walking back to my buddy's place, one night I remember his sister turning around and asking, what's that? To which we all turn around. And at the end of the street, we all saw this tall entity, deer skull with horns and a big fur coat at the end of the street under one of the lights. And my memories came back to me and I just remember saying, we need to leave. We proceeded to run back to my friend's place and aside from some odd moments like the power going out and doors opening and closing, it seemed to leave us alone. But a few months later I'm in the gymnasium bleachers watching some sports in my high school when I suddenly start to feel tired. Now I was resting kind of against the railing when I almost blacked out which could have caused me to fall off the railing suddenly and then I saw that deer skull image appear in my mind and I was snapped wide awake. The next few years it was sort of off and on. I would see this thing, then some of my friends or my brother and his friends would as well. When I was around though it always made everything darker and the smell of like mildew would suddenly become very noticeable too. It seemed to attack one of my friends once. It gave me a scar on my wrist that I've pretty well had my whole life and I moved out of my hometown years ago and kind of figured that it was gone but back in February I was walking home one night and felt a similar feeling only to look over at the trees and see him standing there. First time that I've seen him in a few years so it caught me off guard for sure. I still have no idea exactly what it is and though the running theory is a, a nature spirit of some kind due to the alleged history of the land of my hometown. That is honestly just a wild guess and like I said, I have no idea what this is and I don't know what to do about it. So last night I was recording guitar in my studio and I heard someone moving about but nobody was there so I just kept on recording. A while later my wife brought in her toddler. As usual, he strummed the acoustic on its stand and caused usual ruckus of unplugging my guitar cords and all that. She took him and put him into bed and I bent down, plugged everything back in and decided to go take a smoke. As I went through the house, I could hear them in the bedroom getting ready for bed. I'm outside for like 10 minutes and my wife comes out and says, are you out here? I just saw you in the studio and I said, I've been out here for like 10 minutes. She says, I just walked through your studio seconds ago and saw you bending down as I walked through to the garage. She continued and said, what are you doing down there? But when I came back through seconds later, you were gone. Now, we have not had any paranormal activity in the 22 years that we've lived in this house. Nothing like this has ever happened. And it was odd for me to sense a presence earlier and for her to see me when I wasn't there. And this whole thing just gives me chills.
I was about nine years old. My dad, me and my siblings went on a vacation to my grandparents' house that's so far away from home. To visualize the setting too, my grandparents' house was half renovated with the living room and the upstairs room. It was a deteriorating ancestral house, but the kitchen and the bathroom, the upstairs that used to be a boarding house with a few rooms and the backyard was still the original house, not renovated at the time. Everything was still in construction mode, so the TV was in the kitchen because the living room was a complete mess. So, it was midnight and we were watching a TV show with two of my cousins, my sister and my aunt. We'd laugh so loud at the shows and during advertisements cracking jokes, and after a while, there was a really loud noise from upstairs. It sounded like kids running around and we thought that it was my aunt's children playing, but... We didn't even have the time to react or shout at them because this loud noise came downstairs and I think the best way to describe it is like a, a brown colored wind or a smoke sped down with stomping sounds down the wooden stairs. It passed by the TV and into the sink where the glasses in the rack rattled and we just were all frozen in shock and fear and confusion. The wind came back from the sink it seemed, passed the TV again and went up again to the stairs with the stomping feet noise, which sounded like it was in a hurry, running up the stairs. The frames hanging on the walls of the stairs shook and one of them even fell. Honestly, at the time, I couldn't believe that I had just witnessed what I had seen. Something that to this day, I just cannot explain. And it was just so random and out of the blue like that too. I've told this story to a lot of people. Some don't believe me and some do, but... My aunt who always cooked in that kitchen said that she was used to that paranormal stuff as well as my cousins and my dad who grew up in that house. In fact, they just seemed to brush it off the day after, but my mind as a child at that time was horrified to my core. I couldn't forget about it. That experience is something that will haunt me forever, I think. Even now in my adulthood, it's something that I vividly remember. This must have happened nearly 20 years ago now, when I was five, I think. So my family lived in a trailer park, and I basically had free reign to roam around as long as I didn't actually leave the trailer park itself. One rainy day, a friend and I decided to meet at the playground in the center of the trailer park and just hang out as kids do. Usually, we would have stayed at the playground, but for some reason that day, we felt like just walking around, seeing what kind of adventures that we could get ourselves into. This ended up being an awful idea, and the adventure was not fun in the slightest. Due to the rain, there weren't a lot of people hanging around outside that day, so the streets we were walking down were pretty much empty. At one point, a car pulls up next to us. The driver was a kind of thin guy with a moustache. In the passenger seat was a much bigger, bold man. They both looked old enough to be my dad. The driver rolls down his window, though, and looks us up and down. Are you kids a little young to be walking around by yourselves? He said. I should uh, probably preface this by saying that at this point in time, I hadn't quite grasped the concept of stranger danger yet. I obviously smiled at him and replied, Nope, my mum says I can go anywhere I want in the park. My friend kicked me and when I shot around to ask her what her problem was, she had a serious look on her face and was shaking her head no. Luckily, my friend was way smarter than me at that age and did already have a, a bit of a handle on the concept of stranger danger. The driver continues, Well, you might get sick if you stay out in this rain too long, but why don't you let us give you a ride home? My friend shook her head at the man. Uh, no thank you. She then proceeded to grab my hand and started pulling me away, moving ever so slightly faster than our previous pace. The car slowly crept next to us, the driver not giving up that easily. Really? I insist. I wouldn't want you guys to catch a cold or something. My friend kept pulling me forward and, without even looking at him, replied in a slightly firmer tone. No thank you, we're fine. She started walking even faster, me finally picking up on her energy and matching my pace to hers. Then we heard a car door open. I took a quick glance back and saw that the larger man, who hadn't said a word at this point, was getting out of the car. My panic mode kicked in, and I shouted run, 
as I turned to start running through the grass and in between people's trailers. I heard my friend running directly behind me too. We didn't have any idea where we were running to, we just knew that we had to get away from those men. After a bit, we saw her teenage cousin's trailer. We sprinted to it and burst through the door. Luckily, they were home and it was unlocked. We locked the door behind us and frantically looked out the windows, breathing a sigh of relief as we saw no sign of the men or their car. The friend's cousin ran into the room and, upon seeing us breathing heavily and clutching our chests, asked us what the heck was going on. My friend told her everything that happened and she told us to sit down on the couch and relax a bit, just happy that we were okay. We ended up staying there for a few hours, I think watching Disney movies. Her cousin then drove us to our respective homes, telling us that she doesn't want us walking around without a grown-up or a bigger kid like her anymore and... I had absolutely no protest to that after this experience. I never did see those two men again and really I don't think that they were from this area at all. And at the age of 23, I still sometimes lose sleep wondering what would have happened if my friend hadn't been so smart that day or if we hadn't been able to outrun that guy. I shudder to think what would have happened to us. While deployed to Iraq with the army, one night I had been assigned evening guard duty in one of the camp's perimeter towers. These towers were just upended concrete pipe, 10 feet in diameter, with a roof, floor and a ladder inside. It was only two stories up and in each tower was a, a set of night vision goggles, a pair of binoculars, a machine gun, a radio and a spotlight. There were two of us per tower on each shift and on this night it was me and my buddy Smith. It was a quiet, cloudless, moonlit night. So our camp was small and it was situated on a low hill. Five towers in total protected the perimeter, with number three being the one facing the rear of the camp. We had mostly an unobstructed view out for at least a mile in all directions. But there were small hills and valleys, no more than six feet deep at the most. Otherwise, it was just empty desert. While we scanned our sector... Smith and I, we just shot the breeze. We complained about the war, talked about going back home, having a beer and meeting girls. It was the best way to pass the time, really. Then at some point during the night, we hear what I can only describe as the shriek. It was like nothing that I'd ever heard before. The sound came from somewhere off in the dark, maybe 30 or 50 yards away from us, it was short, barely a second and a half long, sharp and loud, ascending in pitch, something that could have been either a woman, child, or animal in distress, or an animal in anger, I guess, but it stopped my heart, whatever it was. It was even more frightening in contrast to the calm quiet of the evening, but then it happened again, and then again. Smith, you hear that man? I asked. Yeah, what the heck is that? He said, grabbing the binoculars and looking out. I don't know, man, but whatever it is, it's freaky, I said. Get the light out there, Smith said. I got the spotlight out, scanning the desert, but there was nothing out there. I kept moving back and forth. Get the night vision, Smith said. Again, I scanned the desert for as far as I could see, but there was nothing. Just empty night air. We got on the radio to the watch commander. HQ, this is Tower 3. Did you hear that? Over. The radio cracked, then responded. Uh, negative 3. What am I supposed to hear? But then the noise had stopped. We described what we were hearing and asked the other towers if they heard anything, but no one but us heard it. Watch Commander checked back with us a couple of times, then came up and looked for himself. He tried the night vision, then the binoculars with the spotlight, but nothing but sand. The shrieking was gone and all was quiet again. We finished the shift with no more interruptions, just the same as before. Except for one difference, I guess. I stayed perched on that machine gun, watching the night, all night. In the morning after we were replaced, Smith, myself and another buddy from the watch commander's office, we went out the gate and headed in the direction of the noise. About 30 yards from the gate was the most horrific thing that I had ever seen. Scattered in about an eight foot diameter was a, a splashing of just an absolute mess with bits of flesh and you name it. 
and none of us could tell if it was human or animal, but whatever it was, almost nothing was left of it. What scared us most, though, is that from the side of the blood, we had a direct line of sight straight to Tower 3. And even without the spotlight, we should have been able to see whatever had taken place here. But neither of us in the tower saw whatever did this. Even the watch commander himself came out to investigate. A report was made and a brief search of the area was conducted. But strangely, there were no footprints or even paw prints. No drag marks, no patterns, nothing. Whatever it was, it shrieked three times, left nothing but blood and flesh and an absolute mess, and then just disappeared. It was well within eyesight of us, but it was never spotted, and honestly, it just seemed to vanish. It's been years now, and I can still hear that desperate noise, and man, every time I think about it, it gives me chills. So I, a 20-year-old female, work part-time at a small business in my local mall and usually work alone. I'm a sales associate, so I'm required to talk to customers and encourage them to buy things. It was the last hour of my shift when a creepy man came in. He was about mid-40s and everything about him was odd. Clothes didn't fit, expensive shoes, socially awkward... He originally asked a pretty standard question about a less expensive item that I happily answered. After this, though, he continued to ask questions, almost as if he wanted to keep my attention to him. He then asks if he can try out our most expensive item in the store, which is a massage chair, and I said yes. Well, we let everyone try it out. At this point, I just thought that he was innocent yet socially awkward, and he gets into the chair to try it out, continues to ask unusual questions... We chit-chat a bit and I tell him the massage chair's features and the price of it. And all of a sudden, the questions get more personal. He asked what high school I went to and if I missed it. Me being naive, I said the high school that I went to and that I didn't miss going. He said some story about a teacher that I'd never heard of and said that he missed high school a lot. He asked if I lived around there, to which I avoided that question, but implied that I lived close. He then repeatedly asked me the price of the chair and asked me to calculate the price along with our second most expensive item in the store as well. I thought that he was actually interested and I was convinced that he was about to buy it. We made commission on the chair so I ignored his creepiness because I wanted to make the sale. He kept insisting that he needed to walk out with the chair today and he has a truck that is big enough to hold it. It seemed that I had finally answered his questions to his liking because... I was able to walk away a bit. He then made a phone call and started describing how I look, my age, where I live approximately, and what store I worked at. He then said to the person on the phone, We got one. We got one. I had suspicions, obviously, that he was creepy, but this absolutely confirmed it. I asked him from behind the cashier's counter, You're not talking about me, right? He shook his head, No. He then stood up from the chair and said that he'll not be buying the chair today. I was scared and alone. Nobody else around but me and him. I ran to the back and grabbed all my stuff and pulled out my pocket knife. He then left the store and hung out right outside the only entrance or exit. I didn't want to leave, but I couldn't stay inside the mall. I waited for him to go out of sight and then quickly locked the doors and I ran outside to my car. I called my manager and she said that I have to close the store properly, turn off the lights and count the register and all that. So she told me to go into a nearby store in the mall and call a security escort. I did that, was escorted back to the store to close up and was also escorted back to my car with no further incident. Now, I live in a city with one of the highest rates of human and sex trafficking in the country and I genuinely believe that I was being targeted by a human trafficker that day. I know hearing this secondhand, it may not exactly seem that way, but if you had been there and if you had heard the creepiness and the phone conversation, I honestly think that you would agree with me.
I, a female and 26, live in a flat building in a good area. It's a long, windy cul-de-sac, so there's not many cars coming in and out unless it's people leaving or coming home from work. My boyfriend, he's away at Thailand for a month, and we usually take the dog out together at night. I went myself, which I was fine with. I mean, I usually feel safe. But last week at around 8pm, I left the flat to take my dog for a pee. My dog is extremely excitable, especially around other people. She just had a spray surgery. She has a cone on her head and stitches that have to heal. I'm waiting for my dog to do her business and a car pulls in and drives slowly past me. The guy did a friendly sort of neighborly nod towards me so I did a smile back, you know, to be polite and all. The guy parks at the front of the building and I'm at the other side of the car park on the grass with my dog. I'm watching my dog trying to get her to hurry up because it was freezing. I look up and the man is stood outside of his car, staring at me now. A little freaked out by this, I turn my attention back to my dog. I keep looking over my shoulder and he's staring with a really creepy and weird smile on his face. I looked away again for a second and he was walking along the road, slowly towards us. I'm a really friendly person, I can be paranoid and aware at times, I know that, as any woman should be at night. But something about him made me feel scared. He's walking so slow as if he wants to talk to me, so I hide behind a van. I know, not my brightest idea. And I'm telling my dog, hurry up and pee. I can't see him anymore all of a sudden though, which terrified me to be honest. All I hear are footsteps coming towards us. The guy peeks his face around the van and my dog goes absolutely nuts. She's jumping around, barking aggressively, which she never does with people, and the guy doesn't take that as a reason to leave. My dog is showing that she doesn't want his presence, but even though she's doing this, he continues walking towards us slowly. I start backing up and say to him to please leave as she's just had surgery and she's too excited. In the most quiet, sinister voice too, he asks, what's your name? I couldn't really hear him, to be honest. He kept repeating the question as well and I eventually understood what he was asking. But my dog is still going absolutely nuts at him, mind you. I say again, please, my dog just had surgery. You need to walk away, she's too excited. Ignored again. Walks towards us, asking my name, so I start walking away from him. He seems to ponder for a minute, still smiling, creepily may I add. He eventually backs up slowly, still facing me. And I swear he did this for at least 20 seconds, walking backwards like that, never letting his eyes off of me. Eventually though, he walks back to his car normally, looks over his shoulder at me, then stands back at his car and stares for another three minutes. I pretend that my dog is doing something when she's really just being a pain in the butt and just standing there. I look up and all of a sudden he's gone. I'm shaking now, sending my sister voice notes about what's going on. She's telling me just go inside, but she doesn't realize that I'm frozen in fear. Eventually though, I, I see a woman and her son rock up at the front door, so I half jog over with my dog to go inside the same time as them. At the front of our building has glass doors. I glance in and the man is standing there, waiting for us. I told the woman... This man has been following me and my dog and I'm scared, and she walks in with me. The man sees that I'm not alone and walks right past us out of the building again. I run into the lift with my dog, get in and lock my doors. I decided to tell my two male neighbors about it, as my boyfriend is away and they agree to run downstairs if I ever need them. I took a picture of his car and registration plate, as my twin sister gets the train home late at night after work and I want her to be wary of him obviously. Well, today I was out with my dog at 11am, just doing our usual walk around the block. We walk into the building and as we're headed to the lift, I see the guy peek his head around the corner. He was looking for me and he started walking towards me. At first I didn't recognize him, but then he smiled his creepy smile and I realized who it was instantly. He said hi, so I said hey, then beeline for the lift. He came towards me and my dog again. I press the lift button, just watching it come down from the sixth floor. He comes and stands closer to me, 
Again, my dog is going absolutely nuts at him. He asks what my name was. He has an accent. He asked again when I didn't understand what he was saying. I asked, what, my dog's name or mine? He goes yours and smiles. I froze and I said a fake name. And then he started to move closer. I had no time to pay attention. The lift was about to open and I could run away. But he told me his name and I replied, nice to meet you. Finally, the lift doors opened. I walk in and I press the button to my floor, hoping that he would leave me alone. But he ran behind me as I walked in and went, I'd like to see you again. That was weird. I was creeped out. I replied that I had a boyfriend, but thanks. As I said this, the lift doors were closing, and he tried to stick his hand out to stop the lift from closing. But thank God they closed on time. I'm only on the next floor up, so I was afraid that he was going to run up so that he could see what floor I got off at. I stopped for a moment and almost pressed a different floor, but I just wanted to get into my home and lock the doors. The lift opens, and thankfully he's not there, so I beeline to my front door. There's a glass door to the stairs, and I swear that I saw someone coming up. I ran in, I locked the front door as quickly as I could, and I was just so confused about what just happened. The next thing that I do is message everyone with the update. They told me to phone the non-emergency police number, even just to get it on a record, so I did that, and the police arrived at my flat at 3pm. I explained everything to them, and they said that I could either A, get the police to go to his front door and tell him to knock it off, or B, next time he does something like that, tell him to leave me alone, and if he doesn't, phone the police as it would then be considered harassment. For now, the police really couldn't do more, which is fair enough, I guess. I didn't want to anger him at this stage, as it's not a, a crime at this point, I guess you could say, but why can't he just leave me alone? I have no idea. I mean, I clearly showed that I was not interested, and it just annoys me that this is happening to me. I hate saying something's going on when maybe it isn't, but I just have a terrible gut feeling that there's something very wrong with this guy, and that this is not the last that I'll see of him. This all happened way back in 1985 and 1986, but they are things that my friend and I will never forget. So I was working the summers at an old retreat in the North Carolina mountains with about 50 other young adults. It was great fun too, and while the place had lots of modern buildings, it was ruled over by a hulking white building built in 1912. I think it's important to note too that most of the building is just an extension of the mountain itself. It was built using the trees from the right where it stands as well as the rocks and the shoulders used for the foundation. It's three stories but really five counting the basement and the attic full of bats. It was great watching them pour out of there every night too. The front of the building is an enormous portico with white columns stretching up all three stories. That porch is full of rocking chairs from which you can see a majestic view of the Smoky Mountains. But the back of the building is where we worked. We entered our housekeeping facilities via a fire escape that stretched straight up to the second floor rear entrance, a single green metal door. That door was one that I knew well. Housekeeping was my department for three summers, and even though this was now just the end of this first summer, I was well acquainted with it already. It was big, green, metallic, and heavy as all heck, with a pull on the outside and a bar to push on the inside to open it. It didn't stay open though, in fact fire regulations required that it stay closed at all times, and it was engineered to shut automatically too. So of course, during the summer with no air conditioning in the building, we kept it propped open with a full bucket of water during the day, regulations be damned. Anyway, a few nights before we left, we were all cleaning our dorms and trying to turn it into a party when we all ran out of cleaning supplies. So around 9 o'clock at night, my best friend and I drive our lazy butts down to the back of the building. It was only a short distance, but there was a very steep incline that we didn't want to walk down. I parked my car right in front of the stairs and we got out. At this point, we both began to feel odd too. For some reason, the air was still and stuffy and... I felt positively enveloped by this building, standing in the middle with those massive wings rising around us. The building was completely dark, 
and since we had been shutting it down for the winter, it was already locked up tight. My friend had been with me earlier in the day when I had locked that door, the one at the top of the stairs. As we climbed the stairs, I felt really oppressed and had to sort of stop for a moment. My friend did too. I told him that I was scared and he admitted the same, which was really weird. I had never felt scared of this building before and I would spent plenty of time in it alone, exploring the basement and even the attic. Trying to push our feelings aside though, we pressed slowly forward again and a few steps up, I just literally felt an icy chill go down my spine. I know it's a stupid cliche, but I've never felt anything like it before or since then, like someone pressed an icicle down the length of my spine. Finally, we reached the top of the stairs and the instant that I put my foot on the top landing, that door swung open wide as anything and stood open for us, revealing the short entranceway bathed in the red light of the exit sign. It almost seemed like whatever it was, it wanted us in there and we both felt it, but it didn't feel welcoming at all. In fact, I've never been more scared of anything in my life. I still get freaked out about it now, 37 years later. But we both stood there, completely stunned for what felt like minutes before I just freaked out, started screaming incoherently and scrambled down the steps, jumping way too many on the way down. But we both ran up the steep incline, yelling and screaming, leaving my car behind. Everyone came running down and searched the building with us. And it was empty, of course. And when we got back... The door was shut fast and locked when we got there. No one could have pushed that door open, mind you, and run away without us hearing them. The floors squeaked when you walked on them, and somebody running would have been very loud. I've looked at this from every angle that I can think of, but I still have no explanation for what happened that night. I worked there for three more summers in that building and have more stories too, but this one... This one always stuck with me. But my friends stayed to work through the winter one year too, and they even saw what they described as a dark man with a hat in the same building. There was something really odd and eerie about that building, and I don't know what it was, but whatever it is, it seems evil. So my boyfriend, Jason, 27 male, and I, 23 year old female, went on a month long trip camping to multiple states. Everything had been going really well until October 9th, when we decided to ditch a campground reservation and we randomly pitch our tent near an Albion Basin within the Uinta Mountains, Alta, Utah, not far off the lake trailhead there. But we parked our car around 3 p.m. at the Albion Basin campground closed for season. Admittedly it was a little tense because this was our first dispersed camping attempt and we had no proper backpacking gear or anything. Upon arrival we realized the area that we wanted to pitch our tent was about two miles uphill. At this point we started to express regret as we had planned a campsite in Nephi, Utah that we decided to skip on a whim. So after grumping around a bit and having a large lunch to avoid packing food, we packed our backpacks with the best gear that we had to get through the night as it was going to be 25 Fahrenheit out. We set out up the trail, seeing the occasional family or couple heading down the mountain. As we trudged on, we both started to feel a bit strange though, as if we didn't really even know why we were doing this. As if we should have just gotten a hotel instead of trying to play backpackers for the night, but... We both felt like we had something to prove, so we continued. Fast forward, we made it up to the lake. Totally empty, so nothing like the pictures. It was disappointing and eerie, to be honest. Whatever. We keep hiking up and up in an attempt for seclusion in flat land when we stumble across a decent space. I see a small cave in the distance and point it out to Jason to deliberate if it's a heck no kind of situation, but... After he checked it out, he says that it seems like a small animal crawl space, so no biggie. We set up as nightfall was quickly approaching, play some cards, bundle up, and decided to go to bed early, around 8.30pm, as we planned to leave ASAP in the morning, maybe 5. We both sort of dwindle slowly, and after what feels like 30 minutes, 
I woke up abruptly at 11.24 p.m. I woke up with a, a feeling that I had never experienced before. I woke up wide awake, scared but unprovoked, and as if there was no way in heck that I was going to fall back to sleep, when I always sleep through the night. Jason was asleep, so I let him be and I just laid there, alert, trying to listen to anything that I could hear, which was nothing. It was very silent, in fact. Around 12am, Jason woke up stirring, but much to my delight as I didn't want to feel alone anymore. I told him that I couldn't sleep, but he suggested that I rest my eyes as we were leaving early in the morning. I agreed, initially not wanting to be a baby, and I say I was pretty scared. This was very short-lived though, as Jason couldn't fall back asleep himself, and we ended up laying there together, trying to sleep, when I ended up blurting out that I was scared. Eventually though, we agreed that it was fine for us to just stick it through the night, as it was now approaching 2.30 in the morning anyway, and... We had a small axe and a pellet gun for protection, so I did not need to be frightened. But not even five minutes later, we're still wide awake and Jason's head perks up so fast that my heart jumped out of my chest and I whispered, what is it? He replied, listen. And I kid you not, we distinctly heard the sound of gravel crunching under boots as if someone walked up to our tent, stopped, and then walked to my side of the tent. I felt the blood drain out of my face in an instant. In real time, this all occurred in no more than 10 seconds, but my mind flashed a million thoughts and for a millisecond, I was convinced that it was a ranger coming to tell us that we couldn't camp there. So I called out, hello, my brain entirely sure that I had heard human footsteps. Within two to three seconds of hearing the footsteps, Jason grabbed the gun and burst it out of the tent for any chance to confront this person as I knew that he heard exactly what I had heard. But, to our absolute shock, nothing. There was nothing there. As soon as Jason bursted out and me after him, there was nobody there. But that made no sense because we definitely heard something or someone walk up so clearly, but nothing walked away. We hardly exchanged two words and... We just packed up our stuff, looking over our shoulders, terrified, feeling watched the entire time, and we booked it down the mountain with only moonlight guiding our way, too scared to turn on our flashlights. This was the worst 20 to 30 minutes of my life, half expecting to look over my shoulder to find someone following us. But when we made it to our car, we locked the doors and we started the descent out of the mountains, almost speechless and scared out of our minds. At this point, we reached the town at about 3.30 in the morning and we slept in a well-lit parking lot of a grocery store after that. We have obviously since discussed what happened that night and we are both still haunted by the sound of those footsteps that we heard that night. This was a few years ago now. It was pretty late, past 1.30 or 2 in the morning. I was living with this boy who was pretty abusive and he had gotten really jealous at this party that we were at earlier that night. Not even an hour after we had gotten home, he tossed me out onto our front porch and locked the door behind me. I was knocking and pleading for him to please let me back inside. I was still wearing what I had worn to the party and it was freezing out. I really wasn't sure what to do. He had my phone, purse, and wallet in the house with him, so I just sat on the porch, crying. When he turned off the lights, both inside and outside of the house, I knew that he wasn't going to let me back in. I felt really helpless and cold, and I thought about knocking on a neighbor's door, though he didn't have many, but I had anxiety about waking anyone up and causing trouble for my boyfriend too, so... Instead, I decided that I would try to walk to this gas station and motel, which was like a little less than a mile away, so I could use their phone to try and call a girlfriend of mine to see if I could sleep over with her. Ironically enough, the road that I was walking on, Donna Pass Road, being so freezing cold was fitting. But anyway, a little bit into the walk, this tall white pickup truck was approaching on the opposite side of the road that I was on. I tried not to make eye contact for obvious reasons, but then I heard the truck stopping and beginning to make a U-turn, and my heart just started pounding when that happened. 
I just about froze up, but forced myself to speed walk at the very least, and the truck pulled up to me and this guy rolled down his window and asked what I was doing out this late. I told him how I was going to meet my friend at the gas station and that she was expecting me. He sort of smiled and offered me a ride. I said no thank you, citing that I shouldn't hitchhike. And he told me, well good, I don't pick up hitchhikers or anyone. You don't look like a hitchhiker though, you just look like you need some help. He just kept driving next to me and told me that I shouldn't think that he was a creep and he pulled out what looked like a police badge and told me that he had just gotten off duty which is why he was in civilian clothes and out so late. He said that he wouldn't mind driving next to me just to make sure that I get where I was heading safely. I'll admit that I was naive and a bit too trusting of his kindness and credentials and when he offered me a ride again I said that it would be nice because the gas station wasn't that far away anyway. So he popped the door open for me and I hopped in. The radio was low. It was a little messy. The ashtray was full of cigarettes. But there were a lot of newspapers on the passenger floor. And as I was moving my feet, some of the papers shifted showing a, a pair of handcuffs, some coffee cups, empty water bottles, rags, a highlight colored bandana, and a few other things. He apologized saying that it was the truck that he took hunting, but it was super warm so I was happy and I didn't mind at all. He told me his name was John. He asked why I was scantily dressed with a jacket and I started to tell him about the party and the fight that I had with my boyfriend. He was super charming actually and really attentive. He even laughed that he could go back and arrest him if I wanted. I asked about him and he told me about his family. He was a young dad. He had a wife, a daughter, a son and a dog. I told him that it was like he had the perfect little family and he laughed and said that he certainly did. Then it had sort of clicked for me to ask him if I could use his phone, but he said no because he had to save his battery. We were approaching the gas station and then he drove right past it. I politely said, oh, I think that's the one, but he didn't answer me. It was then that I felt sick to my stomach and my heart started pounding again. I started getting choked up, my eyes started tearing up and... I was looking out of the windows and watching the lights behind us getting further and further away. It was hard for me to even speak, but somehow I murmured, asking if he could please turn around and he just ignored me. Whenever I would look at him, he just looked empty-eyed and emotionless, totally dead and glazed. I looked back out the window and down at the road to see if maybe we were going slow enough that I could make a leap out of the car without seriously injuring myself. I remember always hearing never go to the second location but I thought about the possibility of jumping out and breaking an ankle and how it would be a lot harder to get away with one foot as opposed to two, debating with myself that there was snow on the ground but then again snow is hard to get along in and especially when you're not fully clothed like I was. I felt so stupid now too because I wasn't even tied up or anything. I was just so scared though like there was nothing but trees, an empty road, and me and this guy. I was crying pretty badly at this point and asked if I could please borrow his phone again. I don't know why I even asked. I think it was just anxiety and fear. But he told me to stop talking. Then he started talking underneath his breath saying, Girls shouldn't be out so late. You shouldn't have been alone this late. Look what you're doing to me, dress like that. And other derogatory things. As he kept saying these terrible things, too many to share here, I wasn't even responding. I was just crying and trying to think past the fear that I was feeling. I remembered the pair of handcuffs that I saw under the papers beneath my feet, so I used that little, I don't know how to describe it, like scoopy motion. I managed to use my feet to scoop the handcuffs up and I used my heels and toes to push them under the bottom of my seat as far as I could. I was thinking of different things that I could do to try and help myself, like if we were close enough to some upcoming lights or structures, if I ever made it to them, I could just grab the wheel and cause us to crash into them, or maybe how if I got lucky enough for a cop to pass us, I could grab the wheel and swerve so that he would appear to be a, a drunk driver and we get pulled over. I guiltily thought about the possibility of this man is just having a weird night and how if I did anything it would hurt him, but... 
I told myself that that sort of thinking sort of got me into this mess in the first place, so I was done with that. He pulled off the road where there were still woods on both sides of us. On his side of the wooded trees were closer to the road, and on mine, there was a small gap fully covered in thick, I don't know how many feet of snow, but it was a lot, before the trees thickly picked up again, maybe 10 to 16 yards away. He turned off the car eventually, and coldly said that there was something wrong with the car and to get out with him. As he grabbed the keys and was stepping out of the car, I grabbed onto the center console and I cried and pleaded not to make me get out with him because it was too cold. He turned around to face me, his door still open, and shouted at me to get out of the car because we had to go check out the trunk bed hatch. I dug my fingernails deeper into the console, thinking my cries of no and head shaking would cause him to come around to my side of the car and drag me out himself. I was crying and said, Please, John, I'm so cold and scared. I was thinking of everything that I'd ever heard. Humanize yourself, use first names, stuff like this. He stared at me in this, like, way I can't even describe to this day. I don't even know how to start, but he got back in the car and I slinked towards my window, scared that he would drag me over the console. He turned off the headlights and everything just looked completely dark blue. He stared at the steering wheel for what felt like years before, lighting a cigarette and looking at his window, back at me, and then back out his window. He heard me shuffle my feet on the newspapers. I was adjusting my legs. But while still staring out his window, he told me if I thought about running, he had a quick way to get me where he wanted me to be. And oddly enough, I was sort of thinking of running minutes before that, but I reasoned that if he wanted me out of the car, then I should definitely stay in. Otherwise, he could chase me or shoot me in case he had a hunting rifle in the back. I didn't dare look. And I'm glad that I was right. I think at that point I sort of hit some sort of bottom of my reserve and instead of panic, there was numbness and exhaustion. There was still an occasional hot tear or two, but I just remember being numb at this point. I talked to a psychiatrist about this sort of thing and he thinks it's just some from my ex-boyfriend giving me PTSD or something, but it was dead quiet. I finally just barely audibly told him that my friend was still waiting for me and asked about his wife and children and he flatly said that he didn't have a wife or children and that his house was empty. I asked him what he was thinking about and he said, I'm thinking about what to do with you. He didn't say it angrily though, he just said it flatly and coldly which honestly scared me even more. I did start getting worked up to a cry and at that point he told me not to cry and turn the car on offering me some heat but I just cried and said that I wanted to go home. Eventually he started driving and kept driving until we were approaching a gas station. I was gauging the right time to reach for the wheel but before I could he started slowing down. While pulling up, he told me not to tell anyone or he would find me. Then he told me all he was doing was teaching me a lesson not to hitchhike with strangers. He was almost coming to a complete stop when he told me to get out before he changes his mind. Before he could even get another look at me to assess my understanding, I was already down out of that truck and sprinting towards the gas station. The panic was overwhelming me, but then I stopped and remembered to try and see his license plate. I turned around, but only caught the blur of the last three numbers as he was driving off. I ran inside and asked the clerk behind the counter to please call the police. I waited until the officer got there and, I'll be honest, I was a little scared that it would be John. My fears melted away when a new-faced policeman got there. I gave him the description of John, his appearance, the vehicle color and the type, the parts of the license plate number that I had caught, the fact that he said that he was an off-duty cop, just basically anything that I could give him. I asked him if he could look at the camera and the officer disappeared in the back for a little bit, then came back out saying that there was really not much on them. I asked if I would be able to look and the officer said no and asked me if I didn't trust him and I told him of course I did. The officer gave me a ride home to my friends though, lecturing me for hitchhiking, consisting of him repeatedly asking if I knew who Ted Bundy was. Of course I knew. I was just naive to think that it would never happen to me and I was desperate for some warmth. 
In the end, I never heard anything back about the report that was made too, so I would try to follow up, and each time that I did, they never got back to me, aside from this one time that I was told that my case number didn't exist. But that didn't stop me from trying to follow up. Throughout the months and years, I asked my friend, whose home I slept over at that one night, if uh, she ever heard of any like weirdness or anything since that incident had happened to her or anyone up here, and she always says no. So in the end, I just sort of had to let it go and try to tell myself that maybe he actually was just trying to teach me a lesson or something. I mean, I definitely never hitchhiked again, so if it was a lesson, it certainly worked. I never heard anything back having to do with the case. I never heard of any other odd experiences up there. Maybe it was just one man trying to teach me something. But honestly, sometimes I think that I tell myself all of that to help me sleep better at night. Because it all felt very, very real. But even if it wasn't real, I'm really glad that I didn't get out of the car in the woods that night. So I used to work in a factory third shift, 12 hours every night. You'd rely on your partner at work to talk all night to get you through the shift and I always enjoyed teaming up with this particular dude because we both hold convos well and always have some interesting stuff to say. Anyways, I'm like 27 at the time and he's in his 50s. I figured that he'd have a crazy story or two, so I asked him about paranormal stuff if he'd experienced anything. He tells me this unbelievable story that I have to say is either true or he copied it from some Amazing Stories episode from the 80s or something like that. But here it is. So there's a town in Ohio that's very old, very wild, forests, and not much around there except a farm or two. And he claims that each time he went out there, he would notice that his watch would malfunction or his compass would act weird and he'd have missing time and things of that nature. So, him and his buddy were out there hunting in this forest one day. They hunt all day, don't think that they killed anything, but they decided to leave. But they're hiking back when a dude, about 30 years old, approaches them on a dirt road on a tractor. Clearly a, a farmer type guy. He questions my co-worker and friend and tells them that they're hunting on his property. They immediately apologize and strike up a conversation and the farmer man takes a, a likening to them. Tells them that the next time that they're out there, if they should get approached or have any issues, just mention his name and they'll be okay. Well, two or so years go by and they get together again to go hunt on this property. A similar thing happens where a young man riding on a mower or a tractor approaches them and they realize that this is a different guy. They tell the young man that they have permission to be there from the owner, the farmer guy from before. And he proceeds to tell me that the young man that they were speaking to gives him a strange look. The man says, You're telling me my farmer man told you guys a couple of years ago that you could hunt out here? They said yes and described the prior interaction. The young man looks puzzled and tells them to follow him back to his old farmhouse. They go inside and there's a very old man in a hospital type bed in the living room watching TV and hooked up to oxygen. The young man says, Hey dad, these men claim that you talked to them a couple of years ago and gave them permission to hunt? The old man looks at my co-worker and his friend in bewilderment and says, I remember you two. You guys haven't aged a day. It creeped them out obviously, but anyways, I guess they talked for a while when they left and but they never went back there after that. Too freaked out by seeing this guy so old after what had only been like a couple of years. But I would like to know what you guys think. Do you guys think this story is just something made up? Is this guy that I worked with full of it? Or is there something truthful going on here? So me and my four buddies drew into a two-day hunt on a reserve. Day one, about 8.30 in the morning, about 500 yards from my spot, my buddy filmed a really fat black bear... We only had muzzle loaders. They're like a Civil War style gun that you get one shot with when you're going to reload with the ramrod and stuff. I never saw any deer, so at 2pm after lunch, me and another buddy scout for a new spot. 
We find a hellacious animal trail and he drops me off. I tell him pick me up and I'll be on the road after dark. He's about seven miles away. I sit there from 2pm till dark. All I see are loads of elk. But the trail wasn't deer, it was elk highway, so it gets dark and I creep down to the road. We're right at dusk, almost too dark to see. Something comes crashing in the thick bushes, about 30 yards in front of me across the road. I think to myself, huh, maybe it's a deer? So I grunt call just to get a reaction, but nothing. So I creep on thinking that I can bust it if it's a deer. But it doesn't budge. It's sniffing like a dog would. I kick the ground and stomp trying to bump it, but it just keeps sniffing. I remember that bear and I'm like 10 feet from whatever this is. I slowly back into a feed plot behind me with my one shot at my hip. I'm going to have to hip shoot it if it is a bear. I get 50 yards in the middle of a field plot, a big bull elk off to my right in the full moonlight, staring too at whatever this thing is. I see something drive out of the bushes, into the thicket across the road to my left, so I run further out, and it's a standoff. I shine my light into the thicket, and I see eyes reflecting back. They look eight inches apart at least, uh, maybe four foot off the ground, and it's just sniffing over and over again. At this point I'm like, where's my bro? It's full dark and this thing is stalking me and using cover. My buddy's light starts shining down the road and this thing crashes through the bushes away from us. At first, I figure that it must be a bear, but thinking back on it, I really don't know what it was, to be honest. It was nothing like I'd ever seen before. Whatever it was, I was turtle heading, I'm not gonna lie. I had one shot in the dark, coyotes howling like crazy too. Predators were out in full effect on the full moonlight the bull next to me and I don't know it was a weird night and I don't know what that thing was but like I said it's like nothing I'd ever seen so yesterday while returning home from my work I was exhausted and at some point I strayed from my routine way back home and I decided to sit down on a bench at a small park the park was empty at the time and about five minutes later, a young man that I'd say he was in his late 20s to early 30s, dressed in a business suit, holding a briefcase, sat on the bench across from me and started to occasionally stare at me. Later on, he got up and sat next to me on a bench and said, How are you, Jennifer? He had a British accent and he was speaking in a very exaggerated manner. I was surprised and thought that this was someone that I must have known from college or high school that I just didn't remember at the time. And when I asked how he knew my name, he simply replied, Oh, it doesn't matter. And then put his briefcase to his lap and clasped his hands on top of the briefcase. At this point, I started to feel worried and I asked him again how he knew me. But before I could finish my sentence, he interrupted me and said, I'll get into it in a little while. But first, let me ask you, are you satisfied with where you're living right now? And then just said my entire address. He then said, what are your thoughts on your workplace? Are you satisfied with your wage? And then he correctly stated my wage. At this point, I was getting really creeped out by him and asked him who he was again and he calmly replied, it doesn't matter at this point or moment. I don't recall what exactly he said, but right now what matters is that I want to help you. He then went on to state a lot of personal information about me that I wouldn't think anyone would ever know and... He especially knew a lot about my personal relationships, about people that I know. As he was saying all this stuff, I started to pack up my things and got up from the bench and asked who he was and what he wanted in a sort of worried manner. He didn't answer me and told me to calm down. I then yelled at him asking what the heck he wanted from me and who he was. And he didn't say anything and he did this very weird thing where he sort of rolled his eyes first and then slowly turned his head behind as if someone was standing behind him and just said, very well then. But the way he did that was so strange though, like almost as if he was a character giving the camera a side eye and breaking the fourth wall. He picked up his briefcase, got up from the bench and he started to approach me. I tried to reach for the pepper spray in my bag but 
He grabbed my arm and said, no need for that, pushed me away, and I lost my balance and fell to the ground. And then he quickly walked away. Obviously, I was really scared after falling to the ground and didn't know what to do for a solid minute. When I got back up, I went the way that he walked away, but I didn't see him. Which was strange, because I should have been able to. It was then that I decided to just get out of the park and just go home. Overall, his mannerisms were really strange, and he used his hands in a sort of elegant manner a lot when he talked. Like as if he was a theatrical actor, and as I stated before, he spoke in a British accent. I live in the US, and spoke theatrically as well, if that makes sense. He was tall, very well dressed, clean shaven, had short slicked hair and was wearing circular glasses. Another detail that I noticed was that he had this square pin on the lapel of his blazer. The pin was white and it had sort of like a little black trident on it. I obviously haven't gone to the police yet, but I do intend to, but I really don't know what to say or what evidence to provide apart from a small wound on my hand. Is there a place where I can ask for some advice about what to do about this situation? I'm a bit lost in all this and I just don't know what to think of it. I don't really remember this very clearly since I must have been 7 or 8 at the time. So I had to ask my mum for some details about this. This all started when I was at Target going back to school shopping. I was looking at some backpacks when this woman comes up to me and starts talking to me and my mum. She was asking my mum questions about me like how old I am, what grade I'm in, what school I go to, etc. She had two kids with her so my mum was a little confused why she was looking at Hello Kitty backpacks but she said that she was looking for some for her niece. And my mum is feeling a little bit weird about this but mostly just brushes it off until this tall bald guy comes from the other side of the aisle and sort of blocks my mum's exits. So my mum is really getting nervous now until somebody else goes into the aisle and my mum takes that as an opportunity to leave. Cut to a year later, I'm shopping with my mum at a Coles and there's these display beds everywhere and I always like laying on every single bed as a kid anyway. I don't notice him but my mum notices a tall bald man staring at us while on the phone. The man never talked, nor will he ever talk during the rest of our interactions. But my mum tells me that it's time to get up from the bed and continue shopping and she keeps an eye on him and notices that he and a woman are just walking around the store with an empty cart, not buying anything. This was in the summer and I needed new swimming goggles, so I was looking at some until the man and the woman, they come up to us. The woman asks, do they have those goggles in adult sizes and... Just as they ask, my mum realises that they are the same man and woman from a year ago in Target. She says, uh, no, they only have kid sizes, and then quickly grabbed my arm and walked away. Many years later, I'm in 8th grade and I was in health class. We were in sex ed unit and we were learning about human sex traffickers and how to avoid them. I went through the lesson and nothing came to me until I was in the car with my mum driving home and... I was thinking about the lesson. You see, one thing specifically stuck in my mind. My teacher said that sometimes these traffickers would have women do all the talking to make people feel more comfortable in the situation. And then I get that memory of the man and the woman. The woman talked a lot and the man didn't say a single thing. I start putting together all the pieces and noticing that they were showing the same signs the lessons were showing us. So then finally I turned to my mum who was driving and said, Mum, I think those people in the coals, they may be human traffickers. But we sort of looked at each other and she nodded and said, Yeah, I think they've been following us for quite some time now. So I must think about this a couple of times a year at least. And I've looked it up, but... I've never found anything similar. This happened a few years ago. So one night, my now wife and I were driving back from Sonic. But we lived in a very old, very small town in West Texas. It was raining, but not heavily. Puddles on the ground. 
Wet enough that it would be weird for someone to be walking around, though. On top of that, there's a lot of roads with little or no lighting, so lots of the roads are mostly dark at night. We were driving down one such road when this happened. As my wife and I were driving, I looked to my right and I saw, well, what I can only describe to be a faceless man. Not deformed, but like actually faceless. His face was white, or really all of him looked white. He looked almost like a blur or something, and... His arms seemed impossibly long, almost down to the ground in fact, and were moving in just a really unnatural way. Arms swinging back and forth aimlessly, but also very fast. But the best that I can describe this man's movements is that he sort of looked like he was glitching. But we weren't moving fast, probably 25 miles per hour because we were in a residential area. I looked at him long enough that I had time to wonder what I was looking at before he went out of my view. For a second, I even wondered if someone was using a weed whacker or doing yard work, but of course not. I mean, it was 9pm and raining. I said nothing to my wife, assuming that my eyes must have just been playing tricks on me. I mean, it was dark, and maybe the rain blurred the window. I didn't know. But a couple of hours later, my wife asked me if I noticed the man on the side of the road that had no face. I could barely believe my ears, and... It's still the creepiest thing that's ever happened to me. So, I'm wondering if anyone might know what this might be called, or if anyone who's had a similar experience might be willing to share it with me. I still have no idea what this was, but I'm trying really hard to find out more information, so if you can help me, I would really appreciate it. This happened three years ago when I was still in high school. My school is very far from my home, so I ride the train each day. Sometimes a friend would go with me too. We would usually encounter our classmate along with her boyfriend in front of us. We never really spoke with each other, but we know that it's them because of their size differences, her height. Our classmate is a girl and she's very small, smaller than the average small height really, and I think she's around my chest level in fact, and I'm just around 156 centimeters. She also has curly hair, which is rare in my country. Her boyfriend is tall and quite big. My friend and I would always try to walk past them on the way to the train, and we would never really greet them because we're too shy, but hey, whatever. Now one day we had a group project over at another classmate's house. That girl, the classmate, was also invited, and we started getting to know each other a bit. She told me that she thinks that I'm pretty cool and wants to be friends with me and that she would always see me entering the school at around 9 in the morning, but she's too shy to approach me. I went silent because, as far as I know, I'm always late for class. I would be at the school at around 12pm or 12.30pm, never too early. I told her that that couldn't be me, but she told me that it really was me. She told me the details of how I would get off my ride and cross the highway running like a penguin. Well, she's actually kind of right, to be honest. Everyone tells me that I ran a bit like a penguin when I have a backpack on me. She continued explaining that I wore a blue hoodie, black and yellow Adidas bag, and a huge black headphone set, so it would be easy to identify me. Now, our country has a lot of hot weather, and no one would wear stupid hoodies during the daytime except for me. I then told her about how my friend and I also saw her, and her boyfriend every day after school on the way to the train station. She looked at me weirdly and told us that that wasn't them and that they actually go the opposite way. They actually don't have anything to do with that train station. Hearing that, I must admit that I got chills. I defended what I said though when I told her that it was definitely them, that she must be making it up just to, you know, have a joke with me or something. I know that her boyfriend wears white glasses and that that's also rare because I haven't seen a guy at our school who even wears the same glasses. But we started exchanging weird looks and I asked her if she's messing with me. She then texted her boyfriend and asked him about how she would always point out to him that she sees me during 9am entering the school grounds. She asked her boyfriend what I wore and he explained clearly a blue hoodie, black headphones, black yellow bag running like a penguin across the street. So, apparently, they would see me at 9 in the morning entering the school and I would see them walking to the train station at around 7pm. 
And to be honest, none of this makes any sense. After our conversation happened though, those, or whatever they were, they never showed up again. Like we tried to confirm with each other, but we or whatever they were were just never there again. I still think about this incident every day after years and it was the most bizarre thing that I've ever been a part of. It continued to happen until we noticed it and it just stopped after we found out about it, which is so strange. I've been with different classmates on the way to the train, so I have other witnesses too and we've all confirmed that we definitely saw them. We never knew why this happened or if it was doppelgangers or what, but what would have happened to us if we approached those, well, things? A part of me says that we're lucky that we didn't approach them, because who knows what those things are. So, I've never particularly considered myself a, a believer of the paranormal, nor am I a complete skeptic. I mean, I, I turn all the lights on to go to the toilet if I've watched a scary film or have been reading some decent paranormal stories, so I must believe, at least to an extent. Anyway, my dad lives in the Scottish Highlands, has done so for the last 20 plus years, and I drive the 14 hour round trip to visit as often as possible, two or three times a year. I've always loved this journey, especially if I'm by myself, as there's around two or three hours of motorway or highway, followed by back roads through the mountains, or through the forests as well, and around locks where I can put music on and pretty much just switch off. For the most part, there's little to no phone signals, so I generally download a couple of playlists before I go, put my phone in its holder and blindly follow the sat-nav until it loses signal. I've been doing this journey for years, so really I have no requirement for the sat-nav, but I love to try and beat the ETA. It can also be quite handy when it has signal to let me know if there's any accidents or diversions ahead and just stuff like that. Anyhow, on this particular journey I was coming home. I'd set off at nightfall as there's far less traffic on the overnight journeys and less chance to get stuck behind holiday makers, especially caravans. Man, do I hate caravans. I was traveling south though in January and the weather was something else. My car showed an outside temperature of minus 12 degrees Celsius and the snow barely stopped. It hadn't stopped since I arrived at my dad's house four days earlier. My wipers were on full speed but still the snow kept piling up on the windscreen meaning that I had to drive around half my usual speed. Every now and then there'd be a short break in the snowfall and everything just looked sort of magical I guess. It was like driving through a Christmas card maybe. But looking down into the valleys as well, everything was covered in a thick white blanket and lit up by the dim glow of the overhead moon, making it possible to still make out the river weaving its way through the cracks and the deepest crevices, reflecting what little light there was. On these roads, there's really nothing in terms of lighting, and what's worse is that there can be quite often a, a large drop on either side of the road. Couple this with three or four feet of fresh snow, and an inability to see any of the road, you've got the potential of a lot of accidents. In order to combat this though, there's eight foot high sticks at the side of the road with reflective tape at the top, red on one side and white on the other. You drive between these and you should be okay. So, I was driving and driving. The snow just hadn't given up and I was focusing on the red and white reflective tape to keep on the road. Up ahead, I saw the dim taillights of another car, a welcome sight, as it was the first I'd seen in like over an hour. Everyone else must have known that it was a bad idea to be out in this. But instead of focusing on the reflective sticks, I was now focusing on the taillights of the car ahead. I couldn't quite work out what make or model it was. It was a lightish, sort of white or light grey SUV of some sort. Holiday makers, I guessed. I thought this because I could make out their roof box and bike rack. They too must have ignored the warnings to not drive tonight. But when I sped up to try and make some ground between us, it seemed to speed up too. If I slowed down, they slowed down too. The space between us remained a, a constant. 
I decided that my headlights must have been annoying them in their rearview mirror, so I kept the distance as it was, blindly following their lights whilst being mindful to try and keep my tyres in the most shallow bits of the snow on the road, avoiding the occasional snow mound. A bit of time lapsed, I have no idea how much to be honest, as I had now switched off entirely, listening to my mix of 90s old school dance, with the howl of the wind and the splatter of the snow on my windscreen, and in between wiper swishes, watching the red lights ahead of me, glowing in the dark like the eyes of a demonic beast, intent on keeping its distance. And it was at this point that I noticed the car ahead start to take a turn off the road, and felt a sudden sense of sadness and sort of loneliness, I guess. I was all of a sudden losing my travel buddy. It was the only other sign of human life that I'd had for like the last few hours. But I then realized I've been so intent on following the car in front of me, I had no idea where I was. Which isn't a, a huge issue, I guess. I essentially just had to stay on the same road for like three hours until I reached a fork in the road, turn right, and then onto the main road and see a little roundabout. Bizarrely though, my sat nav now just displayed lost GPS signal and had me as a sort of a dot on a white background, convenient as everything was covered in snow anyway. But it never did this. It usually downloaded enough of the routes to at least keep the map on the screen. It was then that I got an overwhelming urge to follow the car ahead. I knew that I shouldn't have. I literally had no turnings I needed to make off the road and I really didn't recognize the road that they were taking. And, the more I think of it, I've never noticed a turnoff that goes down the side of the mountain like this. But maybe I, I just never looked. I decided to follow it. Of course I did, I mean, if I ever think I shouldn't do something because it could end up in regret, I'm the sort of person that would probably do it. Although, as I neared the turning, I started to doubt myself, and I thought that I should stay on the road, but no matter how much I wanted to keep the wheels going straight, my hands and body just wouldn't follow it. I turned off. Immediately, I didn't recognize this road as well. I didn't recognize my old road when I was on that either, to be honest. So, I guess it really didn't make too much difference. I mean, everything was white, everything was dark, lots of trees and the reflective sticks... If anything, it looked exactly the same, like I hadn't turned off at all. 10 or 15 minutes later though, and the car ahead started pulling away from me, only slowly but faster than I wanted to drive in these conditions, so I let it. It couldn't really get away anyway, as there was nowhere to go from this road, so I figured that I'd see it again shortly. Another 10 minutes or so passed of driving alone, and then in the distance I spotted the lights again, and this time I was catching up quickly. The lights were flashing in the dark distance though. Amber and then nothing. Amber and nothing again. Great. My travel buddy has got their hazard lights on and they've stopped. I decided that I'd have to pull over and see what was wrong. As I pulled up behind my buddy, a white Audi, possibly a Q3 or a Q5, I'm not sure. I noticed the amount of snow on their car... Surely, way too much for them to have just stopped. And weirdly, there's no tire tracks for me to pull into. But it was 100% the same car that I'd been following. I knew that much. I came to a stop just as a, a woman in a blue coat ran to my window waving her arms. I'm not the most uh, empathetic of people, but it didn't take much to read the relief on her face and see that she'd been crying. She had to pull over because apparently she had a puncture and then explained that she'd been waiting there, unable to call anyone as there's no signal and thought that she'd have to wait until the morning before she could leave. She had her ignition on while she listened to music and tried to keep the DVD player running for her little one, pressing the heated seat button each time it turned itself off until it just wouldn't turn back on. Her battery had completely died at this point. I thought that she was being a bit dramatic, I mean... It was literally only a few minutes that she'd been pulled away from me. I mean, she couldn't have been here long. But, over four and a half hours. Allegedly, that's how long she'd been there. Over four and a half hours, she'd sat in her car with her 18-month-old child, in minus 12 degrees Celsius temperatures, with no phone signal, food, or drink, and nowhere to heat the inside of the car up. So... 
This wasn't the car in front of me for the last two hours, but it looked exactly the same, even down to the dark grey roof box and bike rack. Coincidence? Yeah, I guess so. A really big one, but that's all I can logically think of. But I suddenly felt angry. Angry that the car in front of me hadn't stopped to help. Maybe they thought that I would? That's a pretty big presumption of them, though. So I asked her if she tried to flag them down. A look of confusion or concern spread across her face. And she told me that there hadn't been a single car go past while she'd been there. But I've been... I stopped myself from going any further, obviously. From explaining that I'd been following a car that didn't exist for over two hours. I mean, she was scared enough from being sat here in the dark for the last few hours. In any case... I jumped out and looked in her car, assisted by the light from my headlights. I saw her little one was fast asleep. I asked her if she wanted some coffee from my flask and she said yes. I knelt down in the snow. as She'd already tried removing the nuts and had left the wrench on the ground next to the wheel. It was covered in a layer of snow and freezing cold. But I jacked up her car, removed her tire and replaced it with the, the pitiful space saver from the boot. I lit a smoke and pulled my car next to hers, connected the batteries, and instructed her to start up her car. Once it came back to life, we stood and we spoke, and I asked her where she was going. Sterling, she replied. Brilliant, I'll follow behind you. Again, I thought. That's on my route. She thanked me for helping her, for talking to her, and for calming her down. She thanked me for the coffee and gave me a quick hug. Quick enough to be meaningful, but short enough not to be overly awkward from a stranger. She got in her car and she set off. I got in my car. I sat for a moment staring at the all too familiar taillights of the white greyish SUV with a roof box and bike rack, lit up a smoke and set off. I sped up, I caught her up, I slowed down and she pulled away and her speed just remained constant. I kept wondering how she hadn't seen the other car though. The other car that was exactly the same as her car. I kept wondering how now I knew where we were but yet we'd not turned off or turned on to any other roads. As we neared the civilization of the A roads I started to become aware of the tracks left by my new travel buddy. The tracks in the snow left by their tires. The tracks in the snow that I'm 99% certain weren't there when I was following her or the other her I guess you could say before I stopped and offered her coffee. In any case, the snow eased as we entered a town called Kilmahog. We reached a junction and she turned right. I turned right. We were now driving in sleet, which is wet snow that leaves a sort of dirty grey and brown slush on the ground. Wet snow that makes seeing much harder than normal dry snow. But as we approached the roundabout, she indicates left for the first turning and I indicated right for the last and pulled alongside her. She looked, waved goodbye and she left. Now, I've thought a lot about this experience and all I can put it down to is that someone or rather something took me that way that night, diverted from my normal route, made me feel as though I had no other option but to follow that car, guided me to a stranded woman and a child in freezing conditions with no food, water or heating. I'm honestly still unsure how to explain it. I've not really thought about it too much, I guess. I don't like not being able to understand things or give them a logical explanation. Because I, I guess it makes me feel uneasy. I've certainly never thought too much about the paranormal before this. I've always presumed if the paranormal was real, it would present itself to me if it needed to. If not, I would just live in blissful ignorance. But now, I don't know. And to me, that's probably worse than knowing. So this is a story from maybe around 10 years ago. I was 16 or 17 at the time. I guess I kind of brushed it off because 
well, nothing really bad ended up happening to me, and I put it down to a, oh, well, bad stuff happens to you when you're a woman walking alone at night. But looking back now, I realized just how creepy it was. You see, I was coming home on my own on a Thursday night after being out of the pub with some friends. We had been out a little more centrally in the city, so I had to take a bus on my own to get home to my residential neighborhood. I had done this route hundreds of times, so I didn't see it as being particularly dangerous, especially as I live in a fairly nice neighborhood. It was only about maybe 11pm, but because I lived in a residential area, and it was the middle of the working week, when I got off the bus at my stop, it was absolutely dead, and there was nobody around. Again though, this didn't really spook me, particularly as it was only a 5 or 10 minute walk away from the bus stop to my house. But as I turned down a long residential street that leads towards my house, I noticed a guy walking further down the street. This certainly put me a little bit on edge, but I was reassured by the fact that he had his back to me and was walking away from me down the street. As I kept walking down the street, I noticed the guy turn around and sort of look at me. It's fine, I thought. I always turn around when I hear somebody walking behind me at night too, so nothing weird about that. But I noticed that as we got further and further down the street, he kept doing it. Kept checking that I was still walking in the same direction as him. At this point, I'm starting to get a bit freaked out. Particularly as I'm painfully aware that we're the only two people around just as I was weighing up what I should do, he turned down the path of one of the houses to our right, and man, I breathed a huge sigh of relief. He was going into his house. I was just being paranoid the whole time, I thought. The houses in my area are all terraced with the front doors being sort of embedded into an enclave at the front of the house. What this means is that from where I was standing, about 50 feet away, I couldn't actually see the front of the house as it was obscured by the wall. However, I saw him walk down the path and disappear into the front door enclave, so my logical conclusion was that he was letting himself into the house. Now, I can't describe exactly what made me feel like this, but after that initial sort of feeling of relief wore off, I suddenly got this really bad feeling. So, I stopped walking and just sort of stood there. There was this tiny voice in my head that said, what if he just was faking you out? The feeling became so strong that I stepped off the pavement and ducked down behind a parked car and just sort of waited. After a couple of minutes of crouching behind the car staring at the house, I saw movement and at that, my heart stopped. The man came back down the path, out into the street and was now looking around looking for me which means that he must have been waiting for me in the doorway knowing that if I kept walking I wouldn't see him until it was too late unfortunately for him his hiding place also meant that he couldn't see me so when I didn't walk past as he anticipated he had come back out onto the street to try and work out where I was looking back now I probably should have called the police at this point, but as a scared teenager, my fight or flight brain took over and I sprinted down one of the roads running perpendicular to the street that we were on, as I knew that I could use it to take a slightly sort of longer route home. I didn't stop running too until I got home where I quickly double locked the door behind me, and amazingly, I, I didn't even think to wake anyone in my family up. I literally just, well went to bed and then woke up the next morning and went to school. I dread to think what would have happened to me if I hadn't have just suddenly got a bad feeling and stopped walking that night. Part of me thinks that on some sort of a subconscious level my brain must have registered not hearing the front door shut after the man had approached it and therefore triggered an alarm in my head. But I had no perception of this at the time and I guess the lesson learned here is Always trust your gut. So, I figured that I'd share an unnerving thing that happened to me in the woods. It's the only incident where I was fully aware and believed that my life was actually in danger. It happened in southern Kentucky in Wayne County. Specifically, what I was told was Edwards Mountain. 
This happened in the fall, and uh, I must have been around 19 at the time. So, my friend Kay showed me this mountain range kind of location where a cave was. But we had started to get heavy into caving, and if you know anything about the area, feel free to look it up, but the entire county is riddled with cave systems. Ridiculously so, in fact. We used to keep a map of all of the ones that we'd found or could possibly feasibly get into. Disclaimer too, that this is really dangerous and you should be really careful when you do it. I don't mind revealing locations as well, but if you get injured or shot, that's on you. There's not much you can do to be disrespectful of the area, to be honest. I suppose you should try to be respectful and do things safely, but most country people just dig the heck out of them or use them as trash dumps anyway, so I suppose it's not that big of a deal. Some of the caves I know are very dangerous though, and it's a miracle none of us have ever been harmed. Also, there are toxic caves as well, so be aware of that. For this cave though, it was kind of odd. It was a large cavern, but part of me hesitates to even call it a cave, because it was kind of like a cliff overhang as well, but you could definitely walk inside to a central chamber that was bigger than most apartments. And there was a tunnel that you could exit on the left-hand back area, if you sort of shimmy-squeezed yourself through, that is. It's not far off the road, in the least. It's on a backcountry road, and then there's a small gravel road that you sort of turn off. This road goes into the woods and banks up and left, and it keeps going. I've never seen what's at the end of it, to be honest. Generally, you just park on the bend, and the mouth is up an embankment. So... I've been here twice before with Kay and never ran into other people, and never saw anything of note. We never really thoroughly explored the area either, which I wanted to. We would hike along the ridge to see if there were any other entrances. He was never interested because he thought the place was boring and had been there multiple times before, since it was essentially in his neck of the woods anyway. Anyway, another friend and I are hanging out, Jay and I've managed to get him onto the caving adventure hype train, so I suggest we go and sort of check this place out and walk along the ridge and stuff. We take his car and he brings his handgun. Jay was 23 at the time. We get to a gravel road and as we're coming in, a small pickup truck is coming out. An older, haggy looking woman is driving. Jay was driving a small car, so we couldn't go too far off the road lest we get stuck but she wouldn't budge and let us around. Jay starts to get aggravated and starts cussing to himself. She just mean mugs us. After a few minutes, she finally yields and pulls to the side enough to let us pass. At this point, I would also like to note that as far as I knew, nobody lived back there. At least I was never told anyone did, and there were no signs of any kind posted about private property or anything. The gravel road has no name as well, and as far as we were concerned, and new people come up here often, this was perfectly fine to be here. Jay and I park the car in the band and get out. We check out the main chamber where there's an old fire and start to walk around the ridge on the left hand side. But three things of note as well. We found a, a sifter, not unusual. People dig for arrowheads and pottery in this county all the time but I smell the distinct ghastly smell of, like, bone marrow. I assume that there's a dead animal, but I can't find any carcass, and the smell is strong. I figure since vultures are very common and nest in the cliffy areas, there must be a nest somewhere with a carcass in it. We also find a rope anchored on an extremely steep part of the cliff where there are no handholds to easily climb it. So, naturally, we climb up the rope, and at the top is a flat area with a chair. From there, you can climb a little higher on some other levels, but it didn't really go anywhere. From here, we're now pretty high up, like three or four stories, and can clearly see the parked area from above. And this is when that terrible pickup truck comes peeling down the gravel road from the main road. At first, we don't think anything of it, until it stops a little ways in front of our car and a guy gets out with a rifle. He walks down to our car and starts sort of looking around in the windows and surveys the surrounding area, luckily never looking up. At this point, we crouch and we just sort of watch. 
Then another guy in the truck steps out, also with a rifle, and shouts, Did you find them? The first guy says, I don't see them anywhere. Let's keep looking. He goes back to the truck, gets in, and they drive off the road. As soon as they were out of sight, we both scaled down the cliff as fast as we could, and we booked it to the car, and we took off and never went back. To this day, I'm still not sure if it was private property or something illegal that had been going on, but I am completely convinced that they were looking for us and would not have hesitated to shoot us. It seems like they knew that we were there, and part of me is convinced that that mean mug lady tipped them off. You hear stories all the time about people getting shot over pot patches in the middle of the woods here, and I have seen one pot patch in the woods myself, but this was fairly close to the main road, so it seems a little bit odd that it would be that. Maybe it was private property and we just didn't know, but there's definitely better ways to go about it. And country people can be absolutely off their head, so who knows, maybe it was just that. Either way, I'm just glad that we never got the chance to meet these guys because if we had, I don't think it would have been good. This happened around 13 years ago near Elizabeth Lake in California. My kids and I were looking to buy a house. There wasn't a lot in my price range, but in those days, we just wanted a place to call our home. I remember that it was a sunny day, but it wasn't too hot, so we sort of got new listings from the realtor, and off we went. We had such high hopes, and everything was going pretty well, and we found a few hopefuls, but for some reason when it came down to the last house that was located on a hill, the realtor told us that she wouldn't be going up there with us. I asked her how we would be getting into the house, and she told me for some reason that there was no point. So nobody ever locks it? Well, I didn't understand what she meant by that. And we all thought that she started acting very strange at the end there. But after looking at the pictures of the place, we were sort of excited to go and look. The directions were simple enough. Go up this winding road passing two houses on the right. And up at the very top of the hill overlooking an old unused road stood a large white two-story house with black trim. It looked a bit tired and the yard was somewhat overgrown, but apart from that it looked okay. We pulled into the driveway and sat there for a minute, staring at the bright red front door. The house didn't look scary at first. All we saw was potential. So I went up to the door with my kids behind me anxiously waiting to go exploring. You would think from our history with the paranormal too that I would feel something the second that I touched the door handle, but I didn't. As you walk in though, you're met by a staircase that went up to a landing where it sort of turned left and then they turned into an open carpeted stairs that went up to the kitchen and living room on the second floor. To the left was a door to the garage and to the right was a bedroom and then three more bedrooms joined by a long hall that went straight back and a bathroom at the very end. I decided to look in the garage first to check the foundation and the pipes and that's where my daughter Ginny saw a little cross in the sill of the window. Then she noticed another one on the other window. Not thinking anything about it, she asked if we could keep them so she could make some earrings, and I didn't see why not. After all, they were just left behind. As I started up the open stairs, though, I all of a sudden felt dizzy as if my world was upside down, and even almost fell over, grabbing the rail. I sort of sat down on the top step, and my son Cody came barreling up the stairs, and stopped halfway up and put his hand on his throat while making a face and ran up the rest of the way. I felt better after a moment, so I looked around some more with them. There were large windows everywhere and a door that opened to a balcony overlooking the cliff part of the back of the house, where we stood for a bit, taking in the beauty, but all of us got a, an uneasy feeling, so we went in to further check the place out. Cody was looking at the windows in the living room where he kept picking things up, yelling at his sister that he found another one. My daughter started down the stairs and she lost her footing and I remember her stating that if we got the place, we would have to put in another handrail. I looked at the bedroom in the front thinking that this would be my room, but as we walked back, the darker and cooler the rooms were, 
which I mentioned would be great in the summer, I suppose. I was looking in the bathroom where I suddenly got this cold chill go up through my spine and all my hair instantly raised up. It was a feeling that I'd had many times before. I heard a breath next to me all of a sudden and I knew that if I looked, I might see something. So I turned my head, deflecting my eyes with my hand as I passed by the mirror as I walked out. That's when my older son, who was in the back bedroom, pointed out that there was a cross over the windows and the door to the room as well. Cody then pulled some of the same small crosses out of his pocket and said that he thought Ginny wanted them, so he'd been picking them up after her. I ran to the cross over the window and then to the door and told them that these crosses are different than the ones in his pocket. These are painted over and were meant to stay. At that point, we began freaking out a bit. We saw that over every opening, every window, on both sides of every door, there were these crosses. Ginny made a good point too. As much as we wanted to all just run away, we had to put all the crosses back where we found them. We went together from room to room and put every one of them back where we took them from. Then we started at the front door. Ginny and I were the last to step out of the house. Ginny's words were, wow, it's so much warmer outside. And pretty much as soon as she said that, I got pushed from the back, almost making me run into her. We quickly hurried out after that, and I asked the realtor why she had even shown us that house, but... Apparently, she had never been in the house herself, but you can bet that after hearing what we had to say, she never would. We were talking about it later, and we all came up with the same conclusion, that the house must have seen a lot of evil. We wonder how long they were tormented before they realized that whatever was there must have been too strong for their faith. How bad does it have to be before you throw in the towel, right? Uh, they must have been really frightened for the owner to have painted over so many crosses like that. Whatever took place in that house, it must have been frightening. When I was a 16 to 17 year old girl, I would babysit for a set of twin 8 year olds that lived across the street from me. It was the ideal summer job too. I ferried them to and from various activities, and in between, we spent nearly every second outside. Every day was a new adventure. Adding to the fun too, the twins' family owned a medium-sized sweet-as-pie poodle mix who loved people more than anything. This dog was incredibly smart, gentle, and loving too. She honestly wouldn't have even harmed a fly. But we would count on her to go on adventures with us. She would follow us at a far pace, exploring on her own, but would always keep us within earshot. Whenever we met new people, she would gleefully bound towards them, eager to lick them and get pets, and express just how happy she was to see them. But she was honestly the best dog that I've ever known. I remember one late summer morning too, we decided to spend a few hours drawing on the front driveway in chalk. The kids drew and rolled up and down the street on their scooters. And while I laid on the driveway with the dog, soaking up the heat, and not many adults were around. It was a weekday and most were at work, but we couldn't have felt safer in the midday sun and the safety of our suburb. Occasionally a neighbor would walk down the street and the dog would slide up to them in greeting, while I spent a few minutes making small talk. This continued for a while and... I was getting really relaxed by the heat and the sound of the kids playing and laughing. The dog was resting beside me, dozing, when suddenly I heard a low growl coming from her. It was a noise that I'd never heard her make before and it took me by surprise. I sat up and looked around immediately and there, coming down the sidewalk towards me and the kids, was a man that I'd never seen before. He was older and a bit haggard looking and he was watching us like a hawk. The dog was having none of him, and her growl slowly got louder and more intense as he meandered towards us. This should have been a sign to me, but I didn't know anything. I was 17 and too young to understand to trust my gut. All I knew was to be polite. He stopped with a laser focus on me and started trying to make conversation with me. This was normal, to be honest. 
I mean, other people had walked by and done the same thing throughout the morning. But he was asking weirder questions. Questions about our plans for the day, what I was doing with the kids, where their parents were, etc. It was unnerving, but he was an adult, so I tried to answer in as polite but vague a way as possible. He kept trying to get closer to me as well. The children were mercifully racing away on their scooters for most of this experience. And his gaze turned into something like a, a Leah, maybe. Any time he moved near, though, the dog would growl louder and she started barking viciously. I had never seen her act like this and it actually got to a point where I was holding her back and trying to calm her down, all while apologizing for her behavior. He faltered in the presence of her, though, even though she wasn't big, she was standing her ground and protecting me, even though the threat hadn't materialized in my mind. But just as quickly as he'd come closer, he backed off, said a quick goodbye, and hurried away down the street. I never saw this guy again, and in the many years I babysat for that family, I never saw their dog behave that way either. I've always, always wondered if she sensed some sort of threat from him that... I wasn't able to pick up on that day. I truly think that she protected me and the kids from something potentially really awful. It could have been nothing, and I know all of you guys listening to this may think it's silly to even share this, but it's just an experience that I've never forgotten. I'm grateful for that dog, and I'm grateful that nothing else happened that day. So my friend lived in a super rural, small country town and I had come to spend the summer with her at her grandparents' house. We were both about 13 at the time, but we're both 22 now, and thought that it would be a good idea to sneak out and walk around the town, maybe stop by the park. As we were walking down this one road, about 30 minutes after we left the house, we noticed somebody following us, wearing all black with a hoodie. We both got pretty creeped out by it and quickly ran at a corner before hiding in the dark of some bushes. After the guy passed us and we waited about another 30 minutes, we decided that we should probably head back to a house, so we ran there. Once we got back inside, we couldn't really go to sleep, so we did an all-nighter. And the next morning, we saw on the news that a woman was stabbed, assaulted, and killed on the exact road that we had been on that night. We couldn't help but wonder if the attacker was the man who had been following us, but safe to say, we never did sneak out again after that.